Hello. I thought we would have more of a chill chat today because we've been diving into some heavy topics lately. So I wanted to talk about things that I wish I knew before becoming a nurse. And I've brought, I've brought friends and help with me. So we're going to be talking about the things other people might pop in. Um, we are Everyone that is here, I think pretty much is going to be a nurse uh, with, have for varying amounts of time. I've been one for 10 years. Um, Jay Michaels on the newer spectrum of it. Uh, I actually don't know how long you have been a nurse. I only put your names up, Mr. Midwife. Uh, but we're going to share things and it's not all going to be bad. Some of them will be bad. <laughs> not bad, but just things I wish I had considered differently. And some of them will be more like hopeful, like, oh, I didn't realize it would be this magical experience. Um, maybe someone will have that. We have Scott here. So Scott usually is pretty hey, optimistic. Scott. Um, yeah, Bye. he's our, usually our, our rallying force. And a, a few other people did email me and say they wanted to join because they felt like there was a lot of negativity in the space, which is certainly not something I've ever contributed to in my life. Um, so hopefully this can be something that is a good learning, something that, just things you can consider before diving into nursing. And it will all be very truthful. Um, don't worry. You're, you're starting to <laughs> echo again there, my friend. Dang it. Are we going to do that again? Yeah. I didn't so, anyway, to answer your question, I got, I started in nursing Back in 1996 as a CNA and then graduated with my RN in 2003. So it's been a minute. Yeah. All right. Um, let me. Uh, okay. So I'm echoing. So I'm going to figure out that problem in a moment. Um, basically, we're just going to run down the list. Good, bad. We're all going to throw it together in the chat. If you have things that you wish you would have known before you were a nurse, do let us know. This is going to be much more of a chit chatty chill episode because we've been doing a lot of like heavy dives into things and I just, I just cannot. <laughs> so I also was playing Pokemon in 1996. So there you go. You know, everything's fine. Um, would either of you <laughs> like to, any of you like to take over? Also everyone that's here. Um, oh good. You're not okay for me. Perfect. Let me know if I start doing that again and I will, I don't even know, try to figure you're, out a different you're good solution. Now. Um, I wish, um, I knew it was more of a business. I wish I like, I went into it thinking that I was going to like go and save the world in terms of nursing. And I was very optimistic. It did not even occur to me like the business aspect of it and that that would probably make choices happen that would sort of break my soul. I was like, no, everyone in healthcare wants to help people. We all want to make people feel better. And like everyone that goes into this is altruistic and like just loves helping people, which like, could not be farther from the truth. I think a lot of people go into it with that intention. However, ultimately, at least in the United States, healthcare is a business and they're going to make choices that make business sense, but not human sense. And I kind of wish I had gone into that with a little bit more understanding of, I think it would have broken me a little bit less, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, anyone else? Initial thoughts, and we're just going to go through a bajillion of them. We'll include some from the, from the. I almost called the chat the academy, which I kind of like. I don't really know why. I was like, we'll include things from the academy, <laughs> which maybe is how we should refer to the chat from now the on. Academy of nurses. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Then we can have the little initial after our names, FAD, and the fellow of the academy of. That's right. Nurses. There you go. That's I right. think we will call. Okay, chat. You're now the academy. <laughs> All right. Welcome. <laughs> I had a feeling these were going to fall into um, our own personal narratives. And so Liz's personal narrative obviously is going in to help people, becoming really frustrated in, in primary care and getting out. Um, so I figured that doesn't surprise me. And mine, uh, my, my issue had always been like working with other, other nurses. And so I wish I had realized that your relationship with your coworkers is very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can't be one of those like, look, I'm, I just work here. I'm just, you know, I'm not here to make friends. I just want to take care of my patients and go home because that doesn't last for very long. You do depend on each other and you do, um, uh, your, your coworkers can make or break you. Well, also balancing that with not becoming codependent on them and doing yeah. like sacrificing yourself for them. Right. Cause a lot of the times in healthcare, they'll be like, oh, well, you don't want to let your other coworkers out to like leave them out to dry. So yeah, you should definitely work like another four hours, 
or like do this. So like learning how to navigate that is interesting, but I agree. I think you, you do have to like, you can't just like give everybody the middle finger, like <laughs> social media tells you to, they're like, just, just screw, screw them all. And I'm like, well, hold on. <laughs> The other thing that came to mind right away is in line with my personal narrative of going back to school now. Um, what I wish I had known going into it is that you don't nece- you won't necessarily be able to do this forever because you never know. You think, you know, I'm healthy. I'm going to just, I don't want to be in management. I don't want to be a specialist or what I just, I love taking care of my patients in the ER. I'm just going to do this until I retire, you know, 60, 65, 70, something like that. And then life happens and your back gives out and you have to do some kind of a a redirect. And um, I would have saved money, I think, sooner. I think I would have put more into a retirement fund sooner. But at the time, people told me that. And I said, no, it's my money. I want to spend it, you know, and um, not realizing that the longer you leave it in there, the more it grows. So uh, and you'll never miss it. Put, have it deducted out of your account before you even see it. Immediately when you sign up for the job in orientation before you ever get a paycheck, just Absolutely. like, yeah, take it. And I think adding on to that, consider, this is also turning into advice, consider signing up for when they do the disability thing. And like Scott said, you never think you will be the one who ends up having something happen to you where then you'll need all the special disability insurance. You're just like, no, no, no. I'll just take whatever is like normally with the job. Healthcare is very hard on your body. Keep that in the back of your mind when they give you, when they offer you this other disability insurance, like just yeah, that's a lot so of nurses end up. That's my story. Mm-hmm. Um, so I came to nursing after being in the military for an extended period. And so when I went and signed up for my benefits, there was like the cancer insurance, uh, accidental insurance, uh, catastrophic injury and all that kind of stuff. I signed up for it all. I mean, the cancer insurance was $15 a paycheck. I'm like, who cares about 15 bucks? I guess, oops, I'm not going to get Starbucks for two days, you know, or one day, whatever. Well, two months after I started, I was diagnosed with metastatic cancer. And just by getting the diagnosis, cancer insurance pays out $1,500. Because I had the low form. The high form was $3,000. So it's, I paid $30 for two months. And I got 100% or 100 times the um, premiums back already. So I was like, they made total sense. And what a lot of people don't know is those that cancer insurance, if you get your TSH level checked, that counts for reimbursement. If you get your mammogram, you get, even if it's completely paid for by your insurance, you get a bonus for getting it done. Your annual physical, you get a bonus for doing it. So there's actual incentives secondarily to the insurance. But back to the original question, uh, Liz was saying it's like, forget it's business. It's also politics, especially depending on where you're yeah. at. When, luckily, when I started in the hospital, there was some po- politicking going on, but. It, it wasn't too crazy. I'm a night nurse, so it's even less there. But when I did a short stint as a DON in uh, SNP, a uh, skilled nursing facility, it was the most horrendous experience of my life. And it wasn't even on the nursing side. It was on the administrator side. So, yeah, the, the political nature of it could be stifling. And some some of my experiences were, I was like Liz. I went into nursing because I was going to save the world. I was going to cure all my patients. Everybody's going to go home happy and healthy. And the truth of the matter is something completely different. Um, it's hard. It's really hard. And uh, two of my pet peeves, I guess, in nursing is all the stinking documentation. <laughs> Um, especially now, <laughs> I don't. I feel like I don't even treat patients. I treat the chart. I'm treating paper, not people. And the other thing that frustrates is it, I, I spent a little bit of time in nursing homes. And the little bit of time I spent there, you know, you'd have some, I, literally, I had a couple of 102-year-old patients that were 
um, full codes. Yeah. They've got pneumonia. They're circling in the drain, but do everything to save Grandpa's life. He's 102 years old. How the hell long do you expect him to live? Let the man die. And nobody it seems like we're not good at, at that. At, at yeah. least in American society, we don't let people die with dignity. They die. Getting better. They they die with having cracked ribs because we don't CPR for the last hour and a half, um, and people just don't realize that death is as much a part of life as birth. And death is sometimes a welcome release. It's a welcome event. And whether it's a newborn in the NICU who, who's born at, at 19 and a half or 20 weeks, or a 102-year-old grandpa who's finally got pneumonia and he's hospice anyway, people just don't, I, f I feel like from, from the nursing end, they, they want to force life on people when it's, it's just not practical. You know, there's a brain accident, there's a brain injury, they've been on life support for 15 years, let them go. I think That's we're getting better about that, though, um, as the years go on. I think with a lot of families, my experience has been, they need permission, because our, they want to do something. They, they feel like if they if they give up on that person and say, let them die, that they're, they're failing them in some way, and they need permission from us, basically, to say, you know, it's okay. What you can do for them now is be with them through this process. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. You know, mm -hmm. it, that's, that's, it's changing. I understand where they're coming from. And, and it, it's, and we have a role in that in making that better. Um, I, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I yeah. like what Mel said that looking at death as a failure is like a huge, like that's a huge, I agree. She said it was a pet peeve and I agree. Cause it's not, I think it's how that occurs that can be the failure Mm -hmm. but not the actual event necessarily itself. Yeah. And that being like the goalpost. Um, Ad Kemp said, along with your charting thing, I left computer science because I didn't want to sit behind a computer my whole life. <laughs> bad news, friend. <laughs> Sorry. Bad news. Yeah. Hate to bring it to the wrong field for not wanting to be behind a computer. Uh, yeah, I would do. say. What, like, what, what do you go into, though, if you don't want to be behind a computer? Construction? Truck I mean, driving. You know, yeah. Sure? Well, even then. Yeah. Well, you could be a chef like my wife. She doesn't get around a computer that often. Uh, my brother's a go. chef. He still has to do menu planning and ordering and inventory. So there's, oh my gosh. there's everywhere. Yeah. And just to give you like um, an idea of kind of how much time you spend in front of the computer, um, I would say as a nurse, half of my time was charting, like staring at a computer. And as a nurse practitioner, 75% of it was just staring at a computer. Sometimes that was sitting with a patient staring at the computer, but it was always right there with me, uh, if not more than 75% of the time. What about you guys? Because I think sometimes it's hard to conceptualize it. We're like, oh yeah, you chart so much. I think that like, sounds about right. <laughs> and one thing I what... do is, you know, because you have, you know, your workstation on wheels, when I go into my patient room and do the sit down and um, whatnot, I make sure I talk through with them, especially if they have like, um, family concerns, and I'm going to be annotating that. I like to read back whatever I note to them. And that yeah, way, yeah. they're like, yes, that's exactly what it is. That way, you know, it's not impersonal, because there's been too many times that I go to the doctor, and they're so zoned into the computer. Hey, I'm here. Hello. They forget you're even in the room with them. Yeah. It takes Which a lot of it Which, takes a lot and of to get past that, yeah. And it's hard at the same time because if you're not constantly charting, like if you're not charting in the appointment with the patient, then you're behind. You know what I mean? Which is like a, a horrible catch-22 because you want to be able to pay attention to them and do this. So like I found with that, like the only way to balance that as a primary care person was I would make eye contact for the first, I don't know, minute or whatever, like just looking at them and then literally address it and say, I want to, I wish I could just sit here and talk with you, but I have to keep up with my chart. Otherwise I will, I will never be like, this just won't work. So I'm going to be typing while I'm listening, but I am listening, even if I'm not looking you at the eyeballs and I would try to look up whenever I could. I have to say, I think the ER, there is less, <clears throat> the ratio is different because there's so oh, much yeah. to do. So mm -hmm. a patient comes in and you do their triage, which is all, you know, interview you know, that, that kind of thing. Once you get a patient, if you're working in the back though, you get a patient in, you're like, Hey, how are you? Maybe you have to help them get undressed, or at least you instruct them to get undressed and get ready and everything. Then you do their assign their assessment, which is more of this. Listen to your lungs, push, touch, 
squeeze, whatever this. And then that goes aside. Now I need to put you on the monitor, put you on oxygen, draw your blood, start your IV, spike a bag, start the drip. Um, maybe we need to get x-rays done. You know, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of hand. And then my other patient just pooped, so we got to go and clean that up. And then we have to go. And uh, this patient, I need to go put a Foley catheter in. There's a lot of stuff to do. And, of course, you have to, to chart everything that you do. But, I mean, that's like click, click, click. I put a Foley catheter in and yellow urine came out. So uh, if you don't like computers, maybe you, know, the, you like doing stuff. Then maybe the ER or somewhere like that is, is more you like. There's a reason why all the memes on the internet are like everywhere else. Like your charting is like telling someone's life story. And then the ER is like this note that says like patient. <laughs> yeah. Patient's breathing. Has, has Amanda's question there about the LPNs. <laughs> yes. Um, there's, in my experience, I've worked with both LPNs in the skilled nursing facility and in the hospital environment. There's no difference. The, they, the only real difference you'll ever see between an LPN and an RN is You'll see a lot more of them in skilled nursing and few of them in hospitals, although they're adjusting more to bringing them back into the hospital study as uh, um, uh, forced multiplier. Yeah, yeah. Man, exactly. Patient, not dead. Yeah. Patient, oh, the dead. ER charts. Patient, not dead. <laughs> ER. <laughs> well, true story. Sometimes in labor and delivery, it was such, it was one of those nights and everything was just falling apart. And, you know, it felt like the brown stuff hit the fan, it was all over the walls. And they come in for shift change. They say, okay, give me a report. I looked, there's a couple of times I looked at the other nurse. They all come here and said, nobody died. Yep. That's all I can tell you. Nobody <laughs> died. Really? Yep. That's all the report I can give you. <laughs> Which is just the different type of, you know, the ER is there to stabilize and send off. And the floor is there to learn your life story and like put all the puzzle pieces together. Right. Yeah. So then when we when we ask the ER for more things like, well, what happened when they weren't like when you weren't trying to make them not die? And they're like, that was not my prerogative. <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> yeah, we've talked about that before, how the floor nurses yeah. want to know like head to toe assessments. Like we do focused assessments in the ER. So when you're asking me, Patients be admitted for something that's not respiratory related. And they say, well, how are their breath sounds? I'm like, I don't know. I didn't look. You didn't listen to your patient's breath. I, and I had, I had one guy actually upstairs go, okay, well, why don't you call me back after you've done it? And I'll, we can finish report then. I'm like, that was a little condescending. Um, They're talking in full okay. sentences. They're breathing fine. What exactly. else do you want to know? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's or, the whole I see, category is the whole ER versus the rest of medical. Because they, there's been times when... ER sends up a patient with one line of access, getting blood. They also have a stat iron order. I'm like, well, what do you want me to do? Oh, pause the blood. They can get the iron, and then you can get, you can't pause blood. Why don't you put a second IV in? Well, they were an ultrasound stick. Yeah, you have the ultrasound. We don't. If you bring them up to me, I'm going to call you back in two minutes to come up here and put an ultrasound in. And you know what? You upstairs, the nurses upstairs know how to start IVs too. So. Oh, okay. and it takes it takes less time to start another IV on that patient than it does to call and bitch at me about it. <laughs> and we very much like, like to when they bring up your patient at seven thirty, right in the middle of the handoff, because yeah. their shifts are ten to ten. Or well, we know what this one. They don't care. And we know we what this much... one used to do. Oh yeah, that bed is uh, is not ready yet. <laughs> Making us wait. No, the um, close the door. <laughs> our job is not. Our job in the ER is to do as much as we can and everything, of course, we need to work together, but it's not to do everything so that we bring them up fully packaged and tied in a bow for you, for the nurses upstairs. So if we can, we can, but, you know, and there's certain things that have to be done before they go because there is that time lag, you know, where they're getting settled into the ICU bed where, you know, mm -hmm. um, but I've gone to the ICU to remember, the I know I've gone, go, this is the patient you want. This is the good one. That's the, no. <laughs> but I've actually but taken patients to the ICU and they're like, oh, well, where's the patient's Foley? And I'm like, um, it's on the shelf waiting for you to put it in. I mean, <laughs> you can you can put, a Foley catheter is not an emergency procedure in no. most cases. <laughs> unless you've got urinary retention and BPH is not an emergency procedure. And it's frustrating because uh, maybe this is something I wish I knew too. The whole the different mindsets of the ER nurses versus nurses upstairs that, um, and then and then that kind of clash that that happens and we think um, they uh, we think they're stupid and they think we're lazy, and we're both wrong. 
but it gets to be like that after a while. You know, you're just like, you don't understand what we go through. We have to know about every single different kind of disease that comes in our door. You guys deal with the same thing over and over again. It's all you know. Your, your knowledge base is like this. And they think we're lazy, like we're sitting down, like we don't want to put in a catheter. We don't want to put in a second line. We don't want to do an assessment on a patient. And I think we should probably spend some time in each other's camp, um, yeah. you know, and, no, and walk, walk a mile in the moccasins. Yeah, you're, you're we're right, joking. Scott, though, it's, yeah, but no, go for it. It's, the, 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 ER's, the ER's job is to stabilize and then transport up or out, not to cure. If if, mm -hmm. if right. the floor nurses had their way, they'd be all cured and ready for discharge when they came up from the ER. That's not their job. <laughs> Your job yeah. is to stabilize and ship, and then I'm supposed to fix them up as best I can and ship them off to somewhere else until they're right. shipped out the door. But at Right, but at the same time, when there's key inf like when you get a report, and I so I'm looking, I get a report, I'm looking at the chart. They're like, "Oh, this person's great," and blah blah blah. Oh, they have a port, and the ER nurses. Oh, they do. Oh, is it access? I don't know. Let me look. I'm sorry, that's a central line. That's sort of important. Didn't need it. Know. Wasn't, but was not important for the stabilization yeah. process. That's right. Yeah. You know, if I know they've got one, I'll use it. But if it's a real emergency, it takes much less time to just throw. Well, the best part is they didn't have any IV otherwise. Yeah. Oh yeah. well. Yeah, they got a port. I love ports. They're great. And I think this kind of highlights like we're joking with each other because we yeah. like each other, but like. There's not always joking involved. Like no. I did not realize before I got into the healthcare system, like no. you joined a team and like that team, you were going to have like weird enemies. And like, I did not Rival realize teams. how, like how <laughs> deep that ran. Um, but I wanted to highlight this comment because it made me laugh irrationally. So um, Matt said, <laughs> patient not dead. And then follow up was patient was dead, fixed. <laughs> as you're ER charting um and, yeah. and then i think i think this is another good one from ad count um the emergency room will chart patient voided and the icu will chart patient voided 156 milliliter concentrated cloudy urine with a small amount of particulate patient complaining of burning sensation pungent smell distinctive taste of esbl <laughs> more we're information joking. that i need <laughs> yes but we're joking but like knowing that you kind of walk into a there's teams. Okay. There's just teams and it's not. And, and not every healthcare facility is going to be the same. I mean, and, and it's going to be, you're going to be so used to doing things certain ways and then you get to somewhere else. It's totally different. For instance, I mean, I can't say how many coup de tip bullies I put in and at my new place, that's a rapid response. A coup de? Yeah. We Depending are not on allowed the size to put a coup de in. It's a rapid response. I'm like, what? Well, and I, th I think nursing, especially in a hospital um, setting, is a lot like medicine. Um, every surgeon has a knife and wants to cut. Every, the solution to every problem is to stick a knife in you. For From my point of view, everything is gynecological or obstetrically based problem. It's just that's how I see the world. And so in the hospital, Scott, all, all Scott wants to do is stabilize and get him out so he can get the next <laughs> person in. Um, all med surge wants to do is get a totally stable patient, but that's not what they do. They get them stable. They're not dying next. And it's everybody, we, we focus so much in our own little bubble um, that it's sometimes hard to feel sympathy for our brothers and sisters on the outside of our department. Because I'm sorry I didn't put the Foley in. I didn't have enough time. I had somebody else who's coming in in cardiac arrest. I thought yeah. this was a little more important than that. But and by the way, they just put it while I'm sitting here arguing with you, they just put a new chest pain patient into my other room and I need to go in. So can right. we wrap this up? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. We, we, we all live in our own talk about this all day, but Yeah, because yeah. the ER can't just start refusing patients, whereas on the floor you could be like, This is not a safe assignment. And that's I think what that's what we <laughs> you know where you don't understand. You can be a, Liz can be your gatekeeper and uh -huh. tie up rooms so that they don't get new patients till the end of the shift. But I can't lock that front door. They That's keep right. coming to me, and there's nothing we can do, and um, and we're at the mercy of the public, you know, coming and in. And then you get mm -hmm. uh, the really upset ED nurse because then they have borders. That is like their oh, worst yeah. nightmare is not, borders. Have you not heard my whole thing? I, I was traveling in Albuquerque, and they gave me a, a patient who was a border at the beginning of the shift, <clears throat> who was, and I'm like, 
I don't know how to take care of inpatients. I'm an ER nurse. Can we, can you maybe like change the assignment? And they're like, Oh no, no, this is your assignment. You're the traveler. And I'm like, let me talk to the nurse manager. And they're just like, and a boarder is, is someone who's like just staying there kind of longer term in case you're not familiar. Yeah. There's no room who's going to be admitted. That's waiting for a room. That's going to be yeah. there beyond 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's no room upstairs. Patient needs to be admitted. So we take care of them in the ER as if they were in a room upstairs, but that's a whole different kind of care. And like, I don't know how to do that. Plus I still have my emergency rooms next door, you know, that, so yeah, that's. And, and that's to cool. this all ties back to, you know, that we're just around that everything's not the same place because I was a travel nurse. The last place I traveled to, you know, I was joking with you about the uh, get a report from the ED there, no reports from the ED. It, they told you someone was coming. It was mm -hmm. a chart review report only. No, we did that too. no voice report. We finally did that too. It's like every time they would say, well, what about this? What about that? I'm like, just read the chart. They finally changed it to you call and say, hey, I got a patient coming up in 15 minutes. Um, you need to read, you know, let the nurse know to read the chart. And then in 15 minutes, you send the patient up. And if they have questions, they can call you, but you don't have to keep calling. Where's the nurse? They're in with the patient. I'll call back in 10 minutes. Now I'm busy. Now they're busy. And so... But the, the flip on that, though, too, is they would send out the patient without an h &P done, without notes in the cup chart, and not that there no orders. I'm like, well, you're keeping about till all that's in place. If I don't have orders, you're not bringing them to the floor. It depends. Some can go without orders. It depends on the, the unit and depends on the hospital. Some well, and yeah. ICU has to have orders, obviously. But. And like, like Scott was mentioning, in labor and delivery, labor and delivery is pregnant women's ER. Right. I take, mm -hmm. I don't care. I, I have to take them. I've delivered patients in the hallways because we're full up. There's no beds. And postpartum is getting upset with us because we're trying to ship as many stable ones off. They're delivered. She, I know she's only been delivered for 20 minutes, but we got to get her off the floor. We need the bed. And they're upset because we're moving too fast and they're, we don't, they don't get a sufficient report and i'm sorry when they step off the elevator i don't get a report i don't even get a, a history sometimes they got the head hanging out the cord hanging out we got to deliver her with or without any information sometimes without gloves because it's just coming we don't have a choice and i'm sorry that postpartum's upset i'm sorry that med surge is upset i'm the yeah. er i don't i can't turn patients away i don't have choice. what we wish what we wish we knew was that what, different, what we wish we knew was everyone's afraid of pregnant people and well, how terrified we would become of pregnant people. Cause I was not prepared for how scared I would become of pregnant people. <laughs> whenever they had, we had, whenever we admitted cardiac pregnant people, we were like, we were like just terror. And then as a nurse practitioner, people came in, they're like, I'm pregnant. I'm like you should probably go to your midwife or your OBGYN because I, I will not be providing you anything. <laughs> yes. Like prescribing, you want to be so careful. Uh -huh. Hi, Nurse Scott. And then in psych, I was terrified of them too because we can't give them any meds. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And then you send them to like the OBGYNs and the midwives, and they're like, just give it to them. It's safer than like. And you're like, I, I, what? Mm. Benefits outweigh the risks. <laughs> exactly. And I'm like, I think maybe you could take Tylenol. That seems like it would probably be fine. <laughs> Please Let drink so much water with it. Exactly. Let me check now. <laughs> Tylenol. What trimester are you in? I don't really know why I need to know that, but I, I should. <laughs> oh. Also, Bridget showing up reminds me that all these lovely humans have social medias that second opinion. But we will link in the description. Please go check them out. Um, some of them, like Scott, have merch uh, and other lovely things that you can acquire. So do go check them out. They are Yes, God has merch. Um, lovely humans who come on here and chat with us, but they have their own things. And if you go check them out, that would make me very happy. <laughs> Thank you. Of course. <laughs> why well, I don't know why you inspired me to remember that versus everyone else, but it's fine. <laughs> um, so oh, yeah, well, because you probably been up, uh, doing a lot of coverage on topics that you've been covering lately too, like the MP being charged twenty thousand dollars. Oh yeah, that and I just talked about that on Twitter or on TikTok, and that's there's so many opinions. It's great oh, for engagement. So 
<laughs> like, let's just light that match and throw it over there for the weekend. There we go. We'll see how we'll, well see how that turns out. But that that brings up another topic of stuff you don't know when you're going into nursing. You don't you don't always look at the fact that there's you know beyond RN there's a nurse practitioner level, and that nurse practitioners sometimes not always but sometimes aren't given the due respect. You know we're not physicians, we're not doctors, but I know a lot. And there's just there's some headbutting that goes on there. Sometimes. And just so if anyone's watching and gets confused, Chad in his state, nurse midwives are considered nurse practitioners. In other states like mine, they are separate. So that's why he's referring to himself, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't mean to speak for you, but I just noticed that. I'm like, wait, you're a midwife, not an MP. Well, but we're we're, adva we're advanced practice. And I think so in your state, you're yeah. both. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's another thing is people forget that there's more than one APRN because especially in the hospital yeah. environment, you will see also the CNS, the clinical nurse specialist, which is an APRN. Which does uh, anyone know what they do? If they have I've only ever seen them in uh, wound care hyperbarics. <laughs> I like literally have read the description so many times and had friends in the CNS program and like they couldn't describe what they were doing. They were like, it just seemed like a good thing to apply for. I was like, but what are we doing? Like, and then they can also prescribe, but I'm like, in what setting? Well, like, they, they, they don't prescribe drugs. They prescribe things like diabetic shoes. I don't get it. I'm like, what, what is and this? You know, then when the budget, when the budget gets crunched, they're the first to go. Yeah. I've only educators. ever seen them in wound care yeah. and a surgical first assist. I don't get it. But those exist. Yeah. Speaking Fun of, though, that's what I was going to say is um, one of the other things I wish I learned connected to what I'm doing with my life now is that there is no good time. There's no perfect time to get your bachelor's or to get your master's. That if it's something you want to do, just do it, do make it, it work. If it's like, well, maybe after the baby goes to school or maybe after we get the new house painted or after the, if it's something you want to do, make some plans um, and, and and do it. Don't uh, don't delay because uh, on the other hand, don't try to do it. Don't get your master's a year out of your BSN program. Please don't do that. No, please practice for a few years before you try to get a master's degree. It's going to, for one thing, it will help you immensely. I'm going through it now. I'm telling you. Some of these classes, the reason I'm breezing through is because of life experience, because I already know this stuff. I've lived it in the hospital. I know what they're talking about. It, to, to try to do that after a year of nursing, is too, I cannot imagine. But if it's something you want to do, don't put it off like I did. And um, I mean, it's never too late, but at the same time, um, go for it. And kind of with that, like you don't even know how many things there are other things other out there other than nursing and being a doctor. And I wish I had known that prior to going into nursing because I went into it and I was like, well, I, I thought I wanted to go be a doctor. And then I realized that's too much money and too much of my life. So my other option is nursing when there's like other jobs, friends, like there's, oh, yeah. there are other healthcare jobs other than those two silos. And that's a huge reason I recommend not going straight to NP school. Even if you think you want to be an NP is because you don't even realize how many other jobs there are that one, you might not even have to go to grad school for, but like you might want to like totally hop, skip and jump and be like, actually, <laughs> I want to go and go to, I don't know, PT school, you know, like something totally different. So there are more than two healthcare jobs. Shocking. I know. Um, and tech. if you're interested in healthcare, but you aren't sure if you want to be a nurse, there are other options. Yes. You don't necessarily have to be. Rad tech. I'm all about rad tech. Radiation tech. You know, PT assist, OT assist, yeah. PT, OT, SLP. There's plenty of specialties that are their own stuff or field. And the other thing, too, about nursing school, while we all do basically the same initial education, there's no two road paths in medicine that are the same. Yep. True. I it's mean, true. I, I was originally at in Mississippi. I didn't have the chance to over-specialize because basically the only specialty there was was pediatrics and um, women's health and then med surge. Now that I'm in Central Florida, what I really want to do is now open to me, and that's pediatric oncology. Those hyper-specialized fields aren't going to be everywhere. So at the same time, don't lock yourself down. Look at your opportunities to move to experience new things. For sure. Bridget, do you have anything to add to the first round? And then I have a few I want to grab from the comments. And then I actually have a positive one. I know, earth-shattering. 
So I thought I was early because I was logging into StreamYard at 327. I didn't realize you guys started at three. <laughs> I just had to bump it back because my childcare leaves at 445 and we kept going like way over. Uh -huh. And then my children were just like ending up at my neighbor's house. <laughs> which is unacceptable. So we had so to So I'm not sure what's, <laughs> what's been covered or not, but uh, nursing was a culture shock to me. Um, I, when I, my first love, you know, nurse is how you talk about how like looking back hindsight, whatever. So my first love, what I actually pursued my passion right out of high school, it was like acting and singing. And then <laughs> I know completely like different. And then when that, I was through like three years living in New York in poverty and struggling and missing my family, I was like, let me go back to school for something. And like, I just decided to do nursing and it was a culture shock. If you're not like, you know how uh, Nurse Scott said that because he's familiar with the fields, his classes are easier. So my I struggled so much in my associate degree program because it's like learning a new language. I had never been around that environment. So don't us underestimate nursing school. And um, maybe if you want to review medical terminology ahead of time or start looking at NCLEX questions, I would definitely recommend that. Yes. And I think another thing on top of that is don't underestimate the power of just basic Google, whoever you are, even like before you go into nursing school or even when you are in healthcare, like find resources like the Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic, um, Healthline is obviously, like honestly pretty good. And like, it's okay to look things up there and just get a launching point. And then go into it. I, I feel like I always had to look for information in fancy places, and you don't. I shadowed a nurse at the local hospital when I was considering changing majors, and that was really helpful. It was a little bit strange, but that was a story for another day. Um, but yeah, we didn't have Google back then, so I had to. I thought same thing. It's we had nurses, we have doctors. I think there's some like physical therapy people. I don't know what they do. I think they work in gyms. I don't know. Um, you know. Yeah, there's a lot of jobs out there. And if you can work, this goes into advice, not what I wish I knew, because I actually did this. I worked as a transporter, which was an amazing job for a, a pre-nursing student. You learn your way all, around the whole hospital because you're transporting patients through every department and you have kind of your ears open all, you know. Um, and then as a nurse aide, uh, they called nurse tech, um, while in school, it's really, really helpful. Well, I'm going with what Bridget said about nursing school being a completely different language. It's also a completely different method of learning because it's no longer, yep. you, you know, we're so used to the teacher teach, we regurgitate and that's it. There's no memorization and regurgitation. It's memorization and application. <laughs> this will detour briefly into um, if you're going to be a nursing student, this is how you should study land. Okay. You find a topic, whatever it is, doesn't matter what it is. You figure out what it is. You Google it. You look in your book, whatever you want to do. The second question you ask is, how will this kill me? And you figure out, <laughs> how will this thing kill you? And then the third thing you do is, what will that look like? And then you think, okay, what will it look like if this is trying to kill this person? And then you think, how will I fix that? And you study in that chunk, and then you move on to the next chunk. But don't move on from the topic until you know what it is, how it'll kill you, what it'll look like and how you will fix it because nursing school wants you to know all of those things and you might as well figure it out now. That way, when the question says like, this patient is fuchsia, like, you know, they just ate like, I don't know, potassium. Is this, what would your intervention be? And you're like, I don't know what any of that means. You have a, a framework for like, is this normal? And you'd be like, oh, they're actually, that's not good. So that sounds like uh, NP school. Um, for yeah, sure, does. but yes. maybe a little, maybe a little less for, I found plenty of regurgitation in nursing school in the basic, uh, basic. Our, our program was not regurgitation at all for undergrad. And it was just like what she was saying. I and, was like, I don't need to know this. <laughs> and it was like, like she said, or the other question I would like to ask myself is what's going to KIL the a K I L L them first. Right. Mm -hmm. So like prioritization, what's going, what's going to be their demise first. And like mm -hmm. that will usually yep. be the right answer. Uh -huh. Exactly. So much, I do remember that. It was like, what is your priority? It was all about priority. Yes. What mm -hmm. would be the first thing you would, it's like, well, I, you know, all four of these things in the, in the multiple choice question I would be worried about, but what's the first one? And it's always airway breathing circulation, A, B, C. Mm -hmm. um, and of yeah, course our favorite is select all that apply. Oh, and you go, you go through each of those and you just figure out which part of like, does this make sense? Does this make sense? 
you can do but it. It's not, a, it's not a bad thing. I mean, I enjoy I enjoy school, obviously, but I mean, it, it's it's nice to actually be learning something and come out feeling mm-hmm. competent instead of like, I took this class in you know sociology. Do I know? Am I any better afterwards? Not really. Um, do I remember anything from my history class? Uh, a couple of dates, a couple of events I didn't know happened. You know, but when you come out of a nursing course. You actually have, you're good at something. You can think about. You can speak intelligently about this thing that you just learned, and and I don't know. If that's what education is all about. So, not a bad thing. Yeah, just different. But it's very different knowing that that it's. And I had a lot of people in my nursing school classes who like were traditionally book smart, and they really struggled with the nursing type of questions. And then there was me who just struggled, which was not shocking because I struggled traditionally and in nursing school. <laughs> that, that was me too. Like I don't. I, I don't want to, this is going to sound so conceited, but like I'd always, school had always been so easy to me. Like I would ace everything, government, AP, um, biology, like AAAA, right? And then in nursing school, it was like, I was like slapped. I don't know. That's not my phone. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Midwife is on call. So uh, when people are, uh, you know, trying to have babies very rudely in the middle of this live stream, uh, how dare they? they will call him. Couldn't have just waited another hour. So I am I am in the middle of a live stream, please. So yeah, definitely I, I wish I had known like how to study differently for nursing school because the first two semesters I wanted to like rip my hair out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And also knowing too, on the flip side of that, if you're not good in nursing school, that doesn't mean you won't be a good nurse. So I've run into a lot of people who are super discouraged in nursing school uh, and then get like that has no reflection really at the end of the day. Or um, even if you get straight A's in nursing school, that n- doesn't mean you're going to be a good nurse either. Like, so right. stay humble. <laughs> exactly. And like, that's one of the first things that um, when I got into nursing school, there was two key things for me that I realized because I did have a medical background. Number one is whatever I thought I knew, I don't know. And I'll only do what they teach me. That was one of the biggest things. Because, you know, you learn things one way, but if you don't do it the way that they teach you, mm-hmm. you're not going to do good. Number two is C equals RN or B equals RN, whatever, at your school. If you don't Unless get your school's right evil now, and they cut you off. Some schools make you get like Bs, which is Yeah, scary. especially right, in grad school, like you can't get Cs. It's Bs often, yeah. Well, that's grad yeah. school in any discipline. But if you don't necessarily get that 4.0, don't kill yourself. Because, you know, like, a lot of us, you know, come from being overachievers in high school and whatnot, and that it's a slap in the face on how difficult nursing school can be, you know. And I know Nurse Scott did a good video just recently, uh, you know, understanding what you need to pass. Yeah, and that's something I struggle with, especially in pathophysiology right now, which I'm coming to an end. By the way, I got 100 on my last test again. But that's... So I'm almost guaranteed. I'm guaranteed to pass now. Now I want my A, so I can say, I, <laughs> well, so I can oh, pass with, achiever. or I can say I I went through my NP program with a 4.0. Um, but, and also uh, something that you should know is there are also people who made it through nursing school by the skin of their teeth, teeth, and that would be me. <laughs> and, and, you, and some of those nurses who really had a struggle. To get that job. last couple of points can be some of the best nurses you'll ever have to Absolutely. because they had to put a lot of extra into it. I know. I know. I'm struggling with but that. Because congratulations. I that's if awesome. It is or from someone else online that said, look, here's the advice. Don't do anything extra. Do what you have to do to pass. And that's it. Then move to your next class and get through this yeah. program. Don't do extra hours. Don't make your paper extra pretty. Don't do, you know. All this stuff, my notes, I'm doing that now. My notes are all typed up and pretty for path. And I'm like, God, I don't have to do that. I'm never going to look at these again. And I'm not going to give them to anybody. Why am I doing this? Um, and no one's going to care what grade I got in these classes, except on maybe my first resume for my preceptor. I can tell them, you know, I, I did pass with A's and blah, blah, blah. But it's a, it's a hard habit to break for overachievers. It for, is. For sure. I'm, a, I'm a fellow overachiever. And it's like, I can't for the life of me not give my all. Like I will, if I ever go to school, I'm just like tied. Like I have no life. That's all I do 24 seven. This is the first time I've had to study, really study. And so just like look over the information. 
hours a day looking over this patho fizz stuff and on the one hand i enjoy it on the other hand it's wearing me out so i'm really ready for it this semester to be over but um and and this last exam is on musculoskeletal and integumentary and i'm like look i could probably get by just listening to the lectures and going easy on myself but but you, you know, won't but i won't <laughs> yeah. I won't. I'll keep going. I'll have nice typed up notes. If I'm maybe I'll publish it someday. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> it's hard. Well, I'm very, I am proud of you. That's very impressive. So good job. Absolutely. For real. That's very, I know it was very difficult in the beginning of the semester when things were. It's just about the time you figure out how to play the game, like how to study for this particular topic. Now the semester's over. Well, I kind of, I think got it a little earlier, but yeah, at some point I'm like, what am I doing wrong? And, and, Maybe this is something too. Uh, if you're going to like NP school, now you're not thinking like a nurse anymore. You're thinking like a provider. So your study is different for this. Instead of going, what are the signs and symptoms? What are the presenting problems? What's the most, you know, now it's what's the pathophysiology? What's causing this disease so that you can diagnose it and treat it eventually? Um, and as nursing students for your RN license, you're, those are the things you're looking at, like, what, what do I need to assess on this patient? What do I need to monitor? When do I need to call someone? Um, what related things do I need to ask? And it's just, it's learning, like I said in one of my videos, it's learning knowledge and it's learning how to think like a nurse. It's a oh. different way of thinking. Um, and way. one thing also I wish I knew before I was a nurse, well, not for me, but for other people, was if you are very academically bright, nursing is going to be very difficult for you at first because you fail before you swim. Right. Because if you are not used to like not knowing how to do things for people who are more less men academically rigorous, I'm very used to failing. It was like, okay, this is very normal. I'm normal. I'm used to being criticized. I'm used to whatever. But I saw it when I precepted people, when you're a new mm -hmm. nurse, you're going to flounder because it's a totally new thing. And this probably goes for most things in healthcare. Mm -hmm. So just do not take it as a, like you are failing. It's just a very new system that you just have to learn. And I saw the people who did very, very well academically really struggled in the beginning and took it as like a personal failure that they were not immediately swimming and doing well because they had not failed as often as other people had. So just know it's not you failing. You're like diving into a deep end of a shoal, like a pool with sharks. Uh, and that's not normal to know what, how to do that initially. <laughs> Yeah. So if you like, I personally struggle with like overachieving perfectionism. So those are not good traits to have. Right. I like, I recognize that and I'm working on that. Um, nurse Scott, you know, he's kind of, so like to a degree, like we will be more like we maybe will accomplish more, but at, at like the expense of our mental health. So be kind to yourself. I had a, mm -hmm. another uh, perfectionist slash overachiever in my class and she dropped out because she got a C on like her first test. And I was just like, like, girl, give it time. Like, like we, we just got but it's it. hard. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's hard to not have that black and white thinking. If you think like that, that where you're like, oh, well. Because you can I'm always recover it. from it. You know, I mean, because that's the thing. Um, I think Scott said it's something similar to that, that video. It doesn't matter what letter you get. It's truly raw points. You know, so yeah. you have this. It's. You had a set number of what you can lose in points throughout the entire semester before you're no longer passing. So just because you gave up a few extra on this one, just make sure you don't give up as many on the next one. Somebody actually watched my video and paid attention. I can't believe it. Yeah, that's exactly right. That I lost like all those points on that test. I'm like, on that test, I got a 74%. That's insane for me. But in the bigger scheme of things, those were the points I missed on that test. And then I didn't miss any or just one or two on the, on the, on the subsequent exams. And it's okay. So yeah, don't get too out of, plus you learn from your failures. Even if you fail a test, you're like, okay, well, I guess I didn't stay. Something about the way I studied wasn't right. I guess I'll switch it up and I'll do cards instead of notes or I'll write my notes instead of type my notes or mm -hmm. study with a partner instead of studying alone or something like that. Um, you do. Well, it's just I like, will, you know, apply the um, nursing model to it. You need to assess why you did, got the score you got, figure out mm -hmm. where you did right, where you did bad, what interventions you need to do, and reevaluate yourself every time. You'll hear that all the time, too. You know, just apply the nursing problem. It works. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, it sounds cliche at all. but No, yeah. Sense. No, that's a good, yeah. Just look at what the issue is, and then you can try to, like, pinpoint it and fix it. And as um, before nursing is life and life is nursing and when you learn nursing process you apply it to your own life you have i mean 
you have a kid who's misbehaving in school. You're like, okay, what is the problem? What have I tried? How did that go? Let me adjust my plan. Let me try something new. And well, you know, you're using that nursing process with all kinds of problem solving and, right. in your life, whether it's finances or raising a kid or, you know, at work. It's um, the good life skills that you learn a lot of times. But hey, somebody did say, um, I wasn't, um, what was it? Oh, I didn't realize how much of my work I would take home with me. And I was that, just about to go back and highlight yeah. her. Where was it? I think it That's was, was it Michaela part. that said that? That's yes. a core skill. Mm -hmm. Work at work is a core skill. And if you have it, like Scott has it, that's yeah. good. And then if you don't have it like me, then you quit after yeah. 10 years. And, and that is the thing that is hard. <laughs> you, you do need that skill to be able mm -hmm. to compartmentalize. Otherwise, it is going to be rough on you. I mean, especially when, you know, you do have, you know, patients who pass and stuff. Some can take it really difficult. Me, once I leave work, it's done. Bye. I, I hold out. And how do you do that? Like you and Scott, do you just think like if it's not in front of me and fixable, then I don't need to like, I can't fix what's like, I cannot fix everything. I can't do anything about this right now. So like, we'll just like. Maybe it's easier in the ER because it's episodic. I don't see the same patients mm -hmm. day after day. I'm not, I'm never going to see these people again. And I've handed up my last patients of the day. I've handed off to someone else. It's their problem now. All right, I got. I'm gonna get McDonald's on the way home. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, just I don't. I think it's habit. I think a lot of a lot of positive thinking, self esteem, compartmentalization. I think it's just to have you force yourself to do it enough that it becomes easier over time. That's interesting because I had almost on my list of like the opposite of this was exactly what Michaela said. I wish I knew how much I would take home with me, and like to this day that I would think about people who I took care of a decade ago, like, mm -hmm. and think about them, especially like the difficult situations. Like I did not expect to have that much, like all of a sudden, like randomly pop up later and be mm -hmm. like, not processing it well. And like, have it really affect you, especially when you took care of them for a long time. Uh, like if they were on the floor for a long time or it was a particularly like really sad situation, I do internalize a lot more of that. And I was not prepared for like how, emotionally damaged I would become as a human oh. at all. I know for me, like there's a few where I made deep connections with the patient through like uh, where I learned something myself through it. Like um, when the importance of patient education with, you know, this one patient group I had or where, you know, the connection I made with this one gentleman when his wife passed. Those key ones I remember and stuff, but a lot of um, so the compartmentalization for me comes from my military history and stuff because you sort of have to be able to do that. Yeah. And it's a good skill to learn. Like I wish I had been able to do that and implement it more, but also on the flip side of that, I am a much better human because I did nursing, which I think I've talked about before. Like I was not prepared to see how much I saw. Like I lived, it kind of it forces you in healthcare but especially nursing to expand your bubble. Cause you're going to take care of people who are very different than you. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be exposed to worlds that are very, very different than yours. And it kind of makes you evaluate it from like a, a much more top down, like expanded worldview point, hopefully not everyone gets there at all. But like, if you do go into it kind of with an open mind, like I'm a much nicer person now because you're much more able to see like, oh, like th you're probably like this because there's probably something that happened to you before or like before I would just be like, you're the worst. I think I've said it before here. That's one of my favorite parts of my career mm -hmm. is that I have been able to, I've, I've been allowed into the lives of these people who are so vastly different from me. And if I worked mm -hmm. retail, I would never have that opportunity, you know, and I've worked around the country. So, you know, I've, I've been able to interact with people who are different color, different sexual orientation, different nationalities, spoke different languages, different abilities. Um, you know, that gang member that I took care of and then they waved at me on the street. <laughs> I'm like, why am I waving at gang members on the street? I'm a white kid from the <laughs> suburbs. But it's because I was an ER nurse. I took care of their guy. And so mm -hmm. when they passed the hospital and saw me outside, they're like, beep, beep, hey, you know? So uh, that's, that's a really rich experience. I'm getting a little emotional because it's really... Mm -hmm. It's a really cool experience. It's really cool mm -hmm. to know that you, 
and it's also validating to know that I do have the skills to interact with people from just because people are different from me doesn't mean I can't create a connection with them and create a mm -hmm. rapport and even be trusted enough to put a catheter in them or start an IV on them or you know something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you, know, you, you won't experience you won't understand what I'm talking about until you've actually done it but trust me there that's what I wish I'd known is the really rich experience that would come from all the different experiences that happen as a nurse I, um, sometimes, so sometimes one of those really rich experiences come from uh, you you just live through a situation like for example in in the ER Scott there's just things are going south and going south in a hurry and you're, you're jumping on their chest, you're doing compressions, you're starting the IV, you're hanging the meds. And half an hour later, when it's all over, you stand back and you say, oh my God, I just saved this guy's life. Mm -hmm. I did that. And it, it's humbling as hell. You're like, I cannot believe that because of what I just did or did not do in the last half hour, I just saved this person's life. I will say I've always looked at it as we saved this person's life, you know, like, wow, you're an ER nurse. You ever saved anybody's life? It's like, not the kind of, like, not like, a, you know, I wear a red cape and, you know, I swoop in and because of me, they live. I've been part of teams that, yeah, absolutely did save people's lives. And that's, that's a good feeling. It does make you feel very accomplished. Like you ask other people, you're like, what'd you do today? They're like, I organized a spreadsheet. And you're like, that's cute. <laughs> Guess I what I did. People, I, I did a, a uh, for Nurses Week, my, one of my first years nursing, I asked the, I did a little newsletter and I asked um, my fellow nurses, like, why did, what, what's the best thing about being a nurse or something like that to put in the little newsletter. And someone said, um, or why do you work in the ER or whatever? And one of the nurses, Jennifer, used to say, because there's nothing cooler than saving a life. Mm -hmm. okay. I think, yeah, as a nurse, um, you, if you're a nursing student, you don't, you have no idea how many times you potentially will be responsible for like saving someone's mm -hmm. life. You're not just passing meds. You're not just following orders. It does take critical thinking. Mm -hmm. let me, my husband just got home. So let me mute my mic. Yeah, no, you're fine. And I think along that lines, like really think about it. Like, I don't know if I fully grasped when I initially was like, I'm going to go be a nurse that like, I'm going to be in charge of people's lives and like, like thinking about that, but really like embracing that, like that's a lot of stress also. It's very, very cool when it goes well, but it's not, it's very difficult when it doesn't. Um, and Kim was saying something about um, like hard things are when patients pass away or things when don't go well. Uh, and you kind of can beat yourself up about it, even though many of the times it was absolutely nothing you could have done, but just like realizing that your job is not going to be one you clock in and clock out of without like just going, like you're doing something during the day that is very meaningful, but that comes with like a much bigger weight. You're than... exhausted. That's another thing uh, talking mm -hmm. about, you know, not realizing that you're going to be the one saving the person's life. The nurse oftentimes is the one, it's the extra set of eyes that will catch the things or ask the question that the doctor may not have thought of right away because, you know, they see a small bowel obstruction the same way, same time, every day. But the nurse catches wave. They're really uh, thrombocyte, uh, have thrombocytopenia or something. There's something else really bad going on. Can we do this? And oftentimes that little extra is what turns the tide for that patient. And oftentimes it's the nurse who's just like, Wait, this doesn't make sense. Let me ask about, you know, can we throw this test on? And, mm -hmm. and oftentimes that's why, don't be afraid to ask your doctors, hey, I, I noticed this is going on. Can we go ahead and do X, Y, Z? Oftentimes they'll say yes. You'll learn so much because you'll say, hey, you know, usually on this type of patient, you order a lipase. But you didn't order a lipase this time. Did you overlook it? Or, I mean, you, do, you don't say, oh, yes. hey. You forgot the live page. You say, you know, usually on this, you, you know, that's something I see a lot. And they'll either say, yeah, good call. I forgot that. Or they'll say, well, in this case, we're not going to do it because you just had one done yesterday or because this type of patient, that's not important. You'll learn, you know, mm -hmm. as you go along from your interactions with, with, um, with providers. Uh, I just, and I was not prepared. We, most of the time we won't get our normal breaks. Like we won't get lunch. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just because for me, we don't have breakers. We've talked about this in like in California, they mm -hmm. have breakers. We don't get a breaker. And this, this happened early on in my nursing career. I had, a, I was about to go on break and a patient called me. He's like, 
hey, I don't feel right. Can you just, I'm kind of cold. Can you come and bring me an extra blanket? And I was debating like, do I, do I have my like friend go and I go on break? Let me just go. Right. Again, the overachiever in me always like want to watch my patient while I go in. And this is a, he's walkie talkie. Usually he just looked off and, and that's where, you know, listening to your gut. And I said, you know what? The doctor had just changed his, um, regimen, his insulin regimen. I was like, let me check your blood sugar. I check his blood sugar. It was 30. Immediately, we had to rapid response. I'm surprised he wasn't. 30 is bad. Yeah, I'm surprised. Under 60, not ideal. Like, I'm surprised he was even awake. So, you know, those are the moments where I'm like, if I had gone on break and he had gone to sleep, he could have gone into that diabetic coma Mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe he wouldn't have come back or like maybe they wouldn't have immediately thought blood glucose. So, you do. You have a lot of responsibility on, on you as a nurse. And um, I guess, too, when you're studying for tests and stuff, always think that you're studying not to just know the material, but that people's lives are in your hands. And so, Bridget, sometimes those are the quiet times when mm-hmm. it's, not, it's not spectacular. You're not jumping on their chest. You save their life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and nobody knows you, life. right? It's a, it's a very one. thankless job. Like people, like no one, no one that day congratulated me. Like nobody, no <laughs> said it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. you don't have to be like intrinsically, like get an intrinsic self of like, wow, that was rewarding because you saved a life, even if you don't get external appreciation. And, and for, for me, it was You know, if someone had said, and probably if we say to you now, Bridget, you, you saved that guy's life. I'm pretty sure your, your response would be, I just checked his sugar. I just, I do what nurses right. do. Mm-hmm. You don't really right. think of it as some heroic act. You're like, this mm-hmm. is what we do. Um, but I, I always took those situations and I, I took a moment to pause and reflect. I always saw that with great humility. Mm-hmm. My God, I just did that. I, me, I did it. Oh, and, that's and why just, we're here. Yeah, that, but that, that's I mean, my job. That's, that's what I've been trained for. It's what I do. No, I'm, I'm getting more philosophical that. than that. <laughs> I'm getting more philosophical than that. That's why we're here on the earth is to help each other. It's just that we do it in a very direct way. But I mean, really, someone takes my trash away so that I don't live in my own filth. And, you know, somebody comes and fixes my plumbing when I need it. And I help fix your body when it gets broken down. I mean, and that's kind of what that's what I was trying to tell um, Nurse Liz the other day, you know, when she was live about talking about the NP. That, you know, Nurse Liz says maybe she could have done something else with her life, but you're also touching countless lives. Like, if you hadn't gone into nursing, this channel wouldn't exist. You know, who knows what you would be doing? And you're you're still in nursing just in an indirect way, and you're still touching lives, and your, shor- your stories are still um, touching lives and motivating people and inspiring people, and even those videos that you have up from many years ago – like those are still online. So it doesn't matter in nursing how you help people, whether directly, indirectly, like you're still helping them. And Thanks. I don't want to blow my own horn, but it, it's the same kind of thing. I've been recently getting these comments on the video that I did on how to give yourself a, 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 a painless self-injection. I've watched that twice now. <laughs> and it, <laughs> the crappy version that I put up 10 years ago on my old channel has gotten lots and lots of views. So when I had my Nurse Scott channel, I said, I'm going to do a really better one and put it on there. And just in the last couple of weeks, I've been getting all these um, all these comments like, dude, you are amazing. I tried this. It didn't hurt a bit. I was so scared to give myself this shot. I've been having my friends give myself this shot, and now I don't have to. I can't thank you enough. Just this kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, my God. It's actually – all I did was make this video, but it's really – helping people in the real world. And, and it's the same with your channel, Liz, and, and other people that have social media, that some of the content can really, really change people. And you may or may not hear about it, just like in nursing. Well, that's you know, okay. There's you may or may not hear about it, but a lot of people are, are, are... Right. And like I said earlier, there's so many different routes in nursing. One of the master's level is nurse educator. That's where a lot of our nursing instructors come from and stuff. But it's also where... Well, you know, I could see nurse influencers being, you know, part of that dichotomy where, you know, you could teach different things. You know, there could be that, you know, cardiology nurse who is really heart set on heart health and everything like that. 
you know, nurse midwife about, you know, o, the OB um, aspect of uh, nursing. So there's multiple different ways. Don't get um, bogged down in a section that you dislike. You know, there's always a method to try something new. Mm -hmm. And to, you know, even if you try it, you're like, oh, you know what? I really, the grass is greener on the other side. I missed the old stuff. Maybe go back and do the old stuff, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. Two really kind of nurses that I've been um, interacting with in grad school now. There are those that have had every job in the hospital. Uh -huh. I had surge for three years, and then I was in OB, and then I was in an IR, and all. And there's people like me that have just done the same thing forever and ever. Um, I was talking to Chelsea about this. She's like, "Patho is hard. I deal with like six diagnoses, and that's, <laughs> you know, that's all I know is one system of the body, but really in depth. But you know, as the ER nurse, you know." all these systems i only know them to a certain depth you know so we all have we all bring our own talents and our own experiences yeah. to, to advanced study and we all bring our own personalities and our own strengths personally to nursing so some people are very much people 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 and some people are very like in your head knowledge people and i've always said i think i may have a toe on the autism spectrum because i sometimes don't know when to shut up and i don't always understand sarcasm and i don't get hints uh and but one of the uh, one of the other personality traits is I like rules and I like the rules to be followed. And when they're not, you know, I've a very and perfectionism and attention to detail. And you know what? If someone is your nurse, like with their life, with your life in their hands, don't you want them to be a little bit of a perfectionist? Yeah, the quality to have in your nurse, you know. So on the one hand, I don't always get along with my coworkers, um, and I don't really know how to express that, you know. To, but I will absolutely do everything for you. you will never be in better hands than you know than in someone who's that perfectionistic in the ER. and so and that's and if you're not that person you bring other things like your ability to comfort patients and your ability to pick up on subtle things and be you know um the emotional support for that patient and you might have to really pay struggle to pay attention to details and when it comes to some of the other stuff we all bring different gifts to the mm -hmm. job you guys hit just just hit two of the last ones that i had on my list one was that you don't have to be a certain type of human to be in nursing. Cause I feel like the stereotypical, like I love people and I'm good at talking to them and like, blah, 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 blah. Like I'm a bubbly little fountain of joy. Like there are very many different areas of nursing and you can go work in the OR and everyone will be unconscious and you can just do your thing. Um, like there's a lot of different places and you will have your own thing that is good at your own little spot. And two, I didn't realize how normal job hopping was. And I wish I had to know that you could just go in and it's like not weird in healthcare to be those nurses who are like, I worked in med search for three years. And then I went and worked in pre-op. I hated that immediately went to the NICU. They were too small. So I jumped over to an ambulatory clinic where all I did was infusions. That was boring. And then like, <laughs> and, you're, and, like and it's been four years. Um, and you're like in four years, like very normal. So very, very normal and very fine. <laughs> be able to do all of that um but yes good job team you hit my points um someone said they didn't know what expect they wish they knew about the bullying yeah mm -hmm. my preceptor my preceptor bullied me on when i was doing med surge and then ironically she wanted me to precept <laughs> her because she so i had got my master's in nursing education and i guess she went back to school after me and she emails me and she's like hey will you precept me i didn't respond <laughs> like you were so mean to me like you really <laughs> yeah well good for you for not sure come on <laughs> get payback <laughs> yeah there is yeah. there is bullying and i wish i could tell you how to magically fix it but I tell you, some of the worst bullying I ever experienced was on every time I would go in and be, I would switch jobs or change to hospitals. I went traveling for a while. And every time I was the new kid on the block on labor and delivery, A, I was the new kid. B, I was a guy. There was no way a guy could possibly know how to deliver a baby and have the compassion and yada, yada, yada. Yeah, Why are you being so mean to me? I've been doing this for 15 years. You think I've gotten away with this for 15 years because I don't know what I'm doing or I don't know how to be compassionate with people, but it was, oh, it was unreal. The bullying sometimes from the other, and, the other women on the unit for lack of better. And, 
Which, and then of course, most of your OB gen physicians are male. Yeah, do the math on that one. <laughs> you get that from just taking new jobs or being a traveler. You got that a lot. You start in a new place and they don't know you. They don't know what you're capable of. Sometimes they talk to you like you're stupid. No, I, I do know what I'm doing. Right. I mean, yeah, I got you. Um, but when you're new, maybe that's something you need to prepare for too is, you know, they're like, oh, you're just a pup. And you're like, I'm 26 years old. And at the time, that seems like old enough not to be treated like a pup anymore. I've been driving for 10 years. You know, I have three been, wrinkles. Been, Excuse been, you. My first gray hair. Come on. Yeah. And it takes a while, but it, especially if you look young, it's going to be like, you know, are you old enough to be a nurse? Are you going to be a doctor someday? Or, uh -huh. you, know, they, you know, you're just a pup. What do you know? And eventually it does get better. <laughs> just like we say, it gets better. And that's why I say 30 is a great age because you're old enough that people start to take you seriously now. And you're still young enough to have all the energy to do stuff, but the wisdom not to do it the night before work. <laughs> and what do we say to people who say, are you even old enough to be a nurse? We say, oh, I'm not a nurse. And you continue doing your job. <laughs> <laughs> now, give me your arm. That's how we deal with that. Nurse, um, nice purse said, I had a time learn to not take things personally, which I think goes well off of what Scott just said. Everyone is busy mm -hmm. and patients are going through hardships. Don't take it personally. I think that goes across the board. People are going to snap at you. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of going back to like what, like we said at the beginning, like you are in a weird situation with your coworkers where they're also close to you in a way that's like odd. And sometimes people act much closer than you actually are. And you snap at people because stress situations are stressful. Your patients don't even know you and they will sometimes be really, really mean to you. Um, and that says a lot about them and the situation that they're in and not about you. So like, please do not take offense to a lot of these people who don't even like, it's not a reflection of you. They don't think you're a bad nurse. They've never even met you. You walked in their room and they were like, I don't want like it's them. It's not you. Also, yeah. GW2021, thanks for the super chat. I appreciate you. So it sounds like this is an obvious, but when we're seeing newer nurses come in and that are shocked, they have to work weekends and holidays and rotations. <laughs> yes. Um, when <laughs> in school, when yeah, someone People don't says, automatically work... get better because it's Christmas. <laughs> yes. And when you're in school and they're like, you'll work nights, weekends, and holidays, and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to work nights, weekends, and holidays. It is very different to then work nights, weekends, and holidays. When you're like, I it's work nights and weekends and holidays. <laughs> Well, the other thing that the biggest shock for me, and it's on this uh, stream, is that if your census is low, you will be put on standby, which means you don't have a choice. You have to burn your pay time off. I had never experienced that before I became a nurse. I was mm -hmm. like, what do you mean you're sending yeah. me home? What do you mean? And I, I have, have to, to use my vacation home? time? <laughs> like, yeah, again, when I started my first nursing job, I was so naive that they're like, yeah, you get uh, so many weeks vacation and you're paid vacation. I'm like, wait, paid vacation? Not just, I thought it was just time you were able to be away from work and it's not an absence. I didn't know they paid you while you were on vacation. That's amazing. So <laughs> I was a little naive at the time. And, and also Did you pay attention to that? what your base rate is because if you are one of those that do nights and weekends where there's differentials, your pay time off does not include differentials. No, it does right. not. That's right. And like, I mean, and it can be a big deal. Like mm -hmm. my first place, it was $3 on nights. And then if you were weekend contract, it was $5. But then where I'm at now, it's five at night, eight on weekends. I mean, it could be a significant part of your check. My, my first nursing job, it, the, the difference was insane. It was like $15 shift Whoa. differential. Yeah, 15 what? bucks. You're like, I can't afford to take a day off. <laughs> I literally can't. Because like like J. Michael said, you take the day off, it goes back to your base rate, not plus your 15. You're like, right. God, I can't afford it. I got to keep working. I hadn't thought of that. I got a quarter. <laughs> oh, no, that's the best part. So you get these nice shift differentials for nights and weekends until they con you into being charge nurse. That's only 50 cents. Yeah, I didn't get anything dollars. to be a charge nurse. <laughs> I was never a charge nurse. Well, the, the funny thing is, well, all those now, years. You know, How did you manage like, that? I'm used to like whoever the senior is is the charge. Here they have 
each unit has like five assistant nurse managers and they dual as charge. I have never seen that before. I was like shocked. You know, you just, you, you just are, if you're crummy at a job, if you're good at a job, it's yours. So, I mean, I was just crummy at it. So they never asked me to do it again. And I got to just take care of patients. Maybe. But you did I, just did enough, right? triage, I did do triage a lot. And a lot of times we would look at the board in the morning. I'm like, Hey, do you want to switch? I'm kind of in a triage mood. They're like, yeah, God, I hate triage. Yeah. You can do all my triage shifts. I'm like, you got it. I'm out there by myself. I'm running the show. I'm, you know, I, that is something for me. It really works. So, but yeah, charge now. You don't want me in charge of people. <laughs> I was also on, on, I did not realize that I would need to practice my negotiation skills so much before healthcare, because I feel like you're just constantly negotiating, whether it's at your bedside job and you're like, so I have to go switch out a trach. You know how I feel about snot. Um, however, <laughs> your patient requires an enema, which I am fine trading if you would like. <laughs> yep. Well, I won't do it for that. What about this and this? Okay, fine. <laughs> Also, make it. sure that you check your hospital policies because, so like, for example, we did, I was checked off in trach care in school, so I just assumed I could do trach care. So right. I had a trach patient, I was suctioning, do, 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 changing the dressing, and then like the charge was rounding. She's like, did you do the trach care? I was like, yeah, I was checked off on it in nursing school. She's like, you're not supposed to touch the trach here. We have a team that does that. I think our is supposed to come and do it. Yeah, yeah. so... That's Don't magical. just do stuff. Well, just like what I was saying with uh, coup de tip, I mean, we literally had to call rapid response for it. And I'm like, it's a Foley with a hard tip. No, nope, you have to you have to rapid response it. That's crazy. You do know that. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's where's just... your rule following, Scott? No, no, no. <laughs> oh, I'm, but I'm all about so, breaking so, rules. Well, all I say is, yes. well, just say it is. Rapid I can tell you because it's probably the same place. <laughs> Yeah, I'm an ER nurse, so I'm a maverick. You know, I get to break your like, it's an emergency. I don't have to do it that way. It's an emergency. We'll, we'll worry about that later. I got a life to save, you know. I'm a midwife with a Y chromosome. I've broken all the rules. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, so those are all the things on my list. I think I think we had, did we have positive ones in there? I think we had positive yeah. ones in there. Yeah, just to, you never know. You're going to have a very rich experience and lots of unexpected things. And, and you can and change down. your mind if you hate it. That's <laughs> fine. Go find a different job or change your mind. That's fine. When I was getting a little emotional a minute ago, I, almost, I, I wanted to say that when I graduated nursing school, my music teacher in uh, middle school was um, Sister Gail. Uh, I went to Catholic school. And I got a very nice graduation card for nursing school from Sister Gail. And in it, one of the things she says was, I know many lives will be blessed by your caring for them. Aww. Aww. And I'm not a religious person, but I've kind of tried to not make a liar out of her all these years. I've tried to keep that in the back of my head, just knowing that, yeah, that was a really sweet. And I, I even got to see her many years later. I said, I don't even know if you remember what you wrote in my graduation card, but that's, it stayed with me. So. Well, you know, I, I know Chelsea can speak to this, but spe especially in my field, um, we are with people in their most intimate, most vulnerable times mm -hmm. of their lives. And when True. we pull the shoulders through and we clamp the cord and hand the scissors to dad and he gets to cut that cord and it's a bouncing baby screaming little girl and who's just pissed off because she's finally outside and there's mom sitting there crying and dad sitting there crying and I'm sitting there crying because it's just a beautiful moment. But you're also at the worst times. Um, just a, a, two weeks ago, um, I went and saw a patient in the office, 38 weeks. And as I'm listening for heart tones, oh. all I get is a deafening silence. <laughs> God, please no. Mm. Baby was dead. Oh. I raced her over to, to um, ultrasound. I said, please tell me I'm wrong. Nope, I was not wrong. And we delivered her later that night. But those are the worst times of my life. Oh, yeah. And you're there. They're crying because mom's crying. Dad's crying. The family's crying. You're crying. And I've been taking care of this lady for months. And now the baby's gone. Full term. Full term baby. Gone. That hurts me. I can't say it hurts me as much as it hurts them, but it hurts. 
it really hurts. And you're there for the happy times when it's a mm -hmm. screaming, pissed off kid who's just been born and you're there for the worst times of their lives. And Chelsea can tell you about that. Those, those cut, those really cut, but you're there. And those are the times that I wish it hadn't been me, but I'm glad it was me. I'm glad I was able to sit there and hold their hand and suffer with them and so forth. Mm -hmm. Chelsea said, it's such a privilege on both ends. It doesn't matter which day I'm there. I'll help you get through this life-changing day. And that would be either yeah. whether it's good or Absolutely. horribly, horribly bad. Absolutely. Um, and, it's, and, and no matter where you're at, what you're doing, there will definitely be emotion in this job mm -hmm. more so than many others. And especially for the men in nursing who are, you know, we're always brought up with this false bravo machismo and all this. It is okay to show appropriate emotion at the appropriate time. Mm -hmm. If you're sitting next to your uh, patient's husband, who where your patient's on hospice and they pass, it's okay to tear up. I think it's good mm -hmm. to, to let them see you. They will recognize that. I think I think it's good when you can hold their your patient's family's hand and cry with them. Absolutely. Yeah, you don't stop becoming a person when you become a nurse. No. In no. fact, I recommend that you don't stop becoming a person. You be you be a person. Be nice to people. Be be understanding of people and and feel the feelings and all that. And that this kind of discussion though reminds me of the whole you know is it a calling or is it a job discussion? Mm -hmm. And I just this seems to me like people that are in it, it's a calling at some level. Yeah. At least at some level. Yeah. At some and level. it's so it's okay to just sit with patients and even if you're just your presence, like you don't necessarily have to say anything or say you, you won't say the magical words that's gonna make them feel better, but just sitting with them and being with them makes all the difference. And you know, sometimes it's just that little therapeutic touch, you know, grasp their hand, let them know they're not alone. You don't yep. have to say a word. And I mean, you'll end up, if you, sometimes you'll just see that smile on their face where they, they know. And having gone through my dad dying, I understood even more. And having been a patient, you know, just having my appendix out and having someone come by and go, I noticed you didn't have any visitors. Do you want some company? I'm like, that was so Aww. nice. Thank you. you know, I'm okay. You know, just that little, little thing. And when my dad died, there was nothing wrong you could say. You know, as you know, everyone kind of tiptoes around grieving families, and there's unless you can say, you know, he deserved it. You know, I mean, that there's something, <laughs> there's some things that are really wrong to say, but mostly anything you say, like I'm sorry, or you know, can I get you something, or just you're not going to say anything that pisses them off. I mean, because you're so in your grief in that moment, um, don't let that intimidate you. But sometimes it's not until you have your own experience in life that you understand how to to deal with patients. That actually reminded me of something I thought of a minute ago. I wish I had realized how important it is to learn therapeutic communication because I didn't really get into that until I studied psychology and worked in kind of a different field for a while. But all those techniques that you can use from reflection to empathy to minimal encouragers to summarization to all those are so helpful in healthcare, especially when you're doing like a, like a, an interview, like a triage interview. We're trying to get information out. Um, that's something I would teach myself if I were a nursing student again. I think I would do that during the summer or something like that. And like Jay Michael said, sometimes the best therapeutic communication is just touch. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have yes. to be heavy touch. doesn't have to be any kind of touch. It just touch. Yep. The hand on the shoulder. Yeah. 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 Also, Chad, thanks for sharing that with us. I know that's a wildly difficult situation. Um, but I think it just very much touches on the impact that you can have on people like in those, hor like they are very lucky. I think that they had you in that nothing about that situation was lucky other than they got, they went through it with someone who they knew cared, you know what I mean? And who was willing to sit with them in it. And I think um, that was very lucky that they had you in it because, and that's one thing that you do get to do if you go when you go into healthcare and especially as a nurse is you get to sit with people while they are having their worst day of their life and you can't fix the worst day of their life but like that is a very special thing to be able to sit with someone while they do it and maybe make it like an ounce better 
And I think you know this stuff because you said, I, I wish I hadn't been there, but what did you say? I, I, I'm sorry to have to I, I, I didn't want it to be me, but I was glad it was me. Yeah. I think that's an acknowledgement of that. Yeah, especially as a provider, you've got your own group of patients that you've seen, you know, regularly for months, and you don't want it to be someone else. You don't want it to be some strange yeah. doctor who they never met before or only met once to be the one telling them that and suffering through that with them. Or the, the one that's hand. so burned out that they're just like, you know. Yeah. Oh, okay. Don't care. Yeah. This happened. Yeah, but on the other hand, you know, when, the, the, when you first meet Scott for the first time, except on this channel, it's probably the worst day of your life. You show up to his yeah. ER because you're having a problem. Yeah. yeah. When you first meet him, it's the worst day of your life. And just having interacted with him on here and, and off offline too, mm -hmm. he's a compassionate person. He's a good mm -hmm. person. I, I want him at my bedside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I try, you know, and, and, and that's when you have to give people a little attitude because I think, Bridget, you were saying, you know, people just don't act themselves in certain situations. I, I started to write a book about that like 20 years ago. And that just, you know, the emergency mind, how people's psychology changes in this crisis situation. And um, you just have to give them credit. And what you learn actually is a lot of them, they'll yell at you, oh, this guy was such a... He, he's like... <laughs> He, um, I bleed to myself. Uh, I love that. He, was, he, was, he was such a beep. Um, he's like, take care of my boy. He had his son in there. I needed to draw blood. I'm like, okay. I said, well, just what I need to do is get some. He goes, no, don't talk to me. Just take care of him. I was like, oh, I, I am. I'm not wasting any time. I just wanted to let you know what we're up. It, no, don't talk. Take care. And I was like, dude, really? So I went and I'm like, hi, daddy's a little upset, isn't he? Okay, we're gonna get a little blood drop. I don't think I said that, but I'm just like, we're, you know, I did what I was gonna do. And as predicted, because I had been a nurse for a day or so, he came out later and said, I'm really sorry. I, I talked to you that way. I was really upset and worried and, I'm, and it wasn't right. And I'm like, you're right, it wasn't. <laughs> um, and a lot of people, they, they do later on come back and they go, I, I'm sorry about the way I acted. So they do sometimes realize it, not always. The psych patients don't because they're not thinking clearly in the world right now. But a lot of other people do. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take a lot to like change people's total day. Like not obviously if they're having like the worst day of their entire life. But when we would admit like tiny little babies that were just born and they had congenital heart disease and you knew it. And so they came out, they immediately had surgery. They come out to you and they have this tiny six pound baby is filled with tubes and lines and airways. Literally, sometimes you could like totally change a parent's day by teaching them how to do one thing. Like, hey, can you help me? just make like, can you just rub their head like right here? See how like this does. And like, just look at it and be like, look at how cute their toes are. Like, do you see how stinking cute this baby's feet are? And like giving them something and like looking around and being like, da da da. And like talking about like little things, like, and I'd kill for those eyelash, like just tiny things of like getting to know, like commenting on little stuff like that can like just totally make someone's day a million times better and giving them the power back in a situation where like, that was like nothing. I just told you your baby's feet were cute, which is true because baby <laughs> feet are so cute. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? But they don't it teach gave them a little school. bit more power. Where did, no. where, did you, where did you learn that, Liz? Because they don't teach you that in nursing school. I don't know. I was a mom. So I, I know I liked my baby's feet. So I figured other people wanted their baby's feet to be complimented. It worked very well. <laughs> and you were just a person. And a nurse, a nurse exactly. and a person at the same time. <laughs> and I think touch too. I wish I knew earlier to just like, if, as long as they're fine with it, you know, sometimes I, I tended to ask, I was like, can I just sit here with you and like, you know, give and you a I hug. Think or... That's a good idea because not mm -hmm. everybody either wants you there or not everybody wants to be touched, especially if you're a male touching a female. I think that's an excellent idea to ask. Mm -hmm. May I come for you, touch you, anything? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or if you have a toe on the spectrum, I really, you know, you got to ask mm -hmm. me first. So mm -hmm. like coworkers that would come up and they're like rubbing your shoulders. It's like, how's it going? It's just like, oh no, that's very, don't touch me. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. That's extremely <laughs> to me. And I just work with you and now I need a cigarette. And you, know, <laughs> <laughs> you just turn around and be like, you are the reason that I can't quit smoking. <laughs> To me, for me, like, for me oh that's gosh. it is. It's just very intimate. So if someone does that, I'm just like, why are we having sex at work? This is really weird. I, I don't even know you, and you're a girl. 
So what's going on here? I'm, very I'm concerned about your health class the in moral of the, story the state you grew kid. up in. The moral of the story, kids, is get consent. <laughs> Just ask. <laughs> is it okay? Oh, oh my goodness. The place All right. Go with these discussions, I tell you what. <laughs> I know. It, oh, it, it started on what we wish we knew and it ended with consent. It ended with consent. It ended yeah. with, yeah. <laughs> oh, here we are. Um, okay. Any other ones? And then I have a couple random other questions I saw in the chat. You guys can stick around if you would like. Um, I feel like at some point we have to do a QA and a stream because we always get like random questions and I feel bad not answering them. I was going to touch on those. Unless you had any other um Things I just you wish want you to knew. say I love psych. It's not as bad as everybody thinks it is. Most of your patients will be walkie-talkie, um, and we need psych nurses. So consider that. <laughs> there we go. Walkie-talkie means they go to the bathroom by themselves and they can move by themselves, which is not common. Okay. Okay. And, and we, just we love that work. in people. And and you can really touch. Like if you're empathic and you have patience, you can really. Like it's, it's, it's at frankly sad. Like they're so appreciative. They're like, wow, thank you for being so nice to me. And you're like, I was just nice. Like, that's what you like. That's the bare minimum. Like, mm -hmm. And they're you know so appreciative. Say, you know how they say common sense isn't so common. Yeah, also so just common, common decency. And, and, and it's not so common either. People just, they long to be listened to and heard. Especially life. after COVID. Common decency. And especially common is we're just not used to interacting with people anymore and the common decency the common courtesies that we used to pay to people we don't do that so much anymore and it's damaging i i haven't talked about COVID in a while but um i remember when during the, i said you know what this is going to teach us how much we really value being in the same space with each other and how much we value touching each other we didn't really think about it before that until it was taken away from us how much i value just seeing your face Oh, yeah, this business? Yeah, just <laughs> seeing your face. Although I will have to say this, I started noticing guys' eyes during COVID. I'm like, he's really pretty <laughs> eyes. Really pretty. I wonder what he looks like under there. I don't know. I don't know. But it's great pretty. ears. I never noticed that about you before. <laughs> <laughs> what What I really miss during COVID, so um, there's a thing called mirror, um, like mirror neurons where our, what we the action that we portray automatically, like the other person will do. And I just tend to just smile like at anybody when I'm working. So I noticed that with a mask on, like no one was smiling. Well, you can see when people are smiling and like, I would try to smile, but like I could, they were, people were just like a lot more serious, a lot, not as nice, not as friendly. And I really think that the ability of not being able to see the, someone's mouth and smile, like it just made everything more distant. Yeah, we would have to either put it in your voice, but you're smiling and say something smiley. Otherwise, mm -hmm. they would wouldn't be able to say, you know know what mood you're or, in. Or if you're sarcastic, are, are you they don't know you're kidding. Mandate now or what's up? Your locations? Do they still do masking or no? I refuse to wear a mask, but I'm a fighter. They can't kick me out of the hospital. <laughs> so, really. I believe at the university they're now optional. Um, at the hospital, I think that some places like they're optional but not mandatory. Because I know at, when I was at New, York, New Orleans in Oshner's, um, which was about six months ago, they made it optional. Um, and then Maryland, it was required. And then here, it's optional. It's still required it's still, everywhere here. It's still required where I live in Pennsylvania. I really don't want to wear one. They're really uncomfortable. And I understand, I'll wear it when I have to, you know, if there's someone that's being a compromise, but like, God, I'm going to have to do clinicals next year. I really hope by next year it's optional. I can't imagine. I didn't Indeed. work through COVID. I, I didn't work through COVID. So I can't, I don't, I, I don't know if I would have survived. That's just so it's difficult. It's awesome. Anyway, good to know. Good, good to know. Good to know. Hey doggies. Um, now that I brought mine because she was making horrible noises and I needed the internet to know that I was not making those noises. Like whatever those noises were <laughs> came from this animal. <laughs> she was like having a malfunction, the poor thing. Um, let me see. Someone else had, um, someone else had mentioned social skills, which I thought was a good point. 
and then we can do some random questions was learning, like practicing. They wish they had practiced their social skills earlier, which I honestly agree. Like anything you can do to get better social skills. Yes. Oh, I wish I had um, knew how to be like more socially intelligent. I probably had to learn time, but communication is essential and it's brutal initially. If you don't know how to like just speak with others. Yes. Yes. Go be a waitress or a bartender problem solved. And how you care. So going back to those social skills, how you carry yourself will sometimes like if like bullies will pick on sometimes people that be, they view as weak and so will patients, mm -hmm. right? So you need to learn how to walk into a room, look like you know what you're doing. And of course that comes with time. So if at first you're uncertain, that's okay. But just work on maybe standing straight, not looking down at the floor, not hunching over, look up your meds before you go in the room, no side effects, what its purpose. So that if they ask you these questions, you're not like, eh. um, because sometimes they, 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 will look at you in favor of belief if you don't know what you're doing. That reminds me, know the, have these phrases in your back pocket so you don't have to look stupid. So when they yes. say, what's this? And you don't know, you can go, that's a really good question. You know what? I'm going to look that up for you. And then it's Practice like, oh, God, difficult conversations ahead of time. What, what I find easiest is, why don't we learn about this one together? Yeah. Yep. Or I, I should know this. I don't remember. You know what? I'm glad you asked that because I need to look that up. Instead of, I don't know. I'm not sure, but I can go find, but I know where I can find out. I'll be right back. <laughs> Good for anybody. Cause I was in the grocery store the other day and I said, where's the parsley? And the guy was like, um, geez, I don't know. <laughs> Could we find out please? Yeah. <laughs> even if you work in a grocery store, even if you work in a grocery store, please learn those. <laughs> well, 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 right there, what was, so I walk into my new employer first day, I'm at the HR area. And he's like, do you know where this is? Go now, but I know where we can find out together. Right. I was like, I had never been in the building before. Good thing yes. I did because I was in the wrong place too. So, yeah. And then follow up. I yes. didn't know it was the medical office building and not the hospital. They're in the same place. Yes. Um, also, Holly is not a good guard dog. That is my dog. Um, story time briefly. When I had my first a baby, I think, or something, I wasn't able to be home. And my friend had to come into my home who had never met my dog to take care of my dog. Uh, because I was like, I'm having a baby. Could you just like go let her out before my parents get there? Holly's napping friend walks into house, never met friend, um, which just wakes up, rolls over, does not show any sign of concern. <laughs> my parents are not here. There's this random person that is here, literally just like rolled over, wagged, played with her for like half an hour and left, never barked, no concern. So no, F. Get, get yeah, it's not no biscuit. Yeah. I get home and they go crazy barking. Get a dachshund, get a dachshund. These guys watch, <laughs> here, watch this. Oh, oh yeah, look saw. at them. They're on like alert. Who is it? <laughs> and they're off to go find out. Like, oh, oh. Uh, we've gotten better. Maybe that's a, a tribute to my training. We've gotten better. No, no. Um, someone wanted you, Jasmine wanted you to talk more about psych nursing. Uh, if you can, Bridget, what you like, what you don't like. Pros? And, and I saw that someone else also asked, is it safe? So it depends. There's different acuities. So um, there's some hospitals that are lower acuity psych and those are more safe. And those are the ones that I usually take my students to. And I have never witnessed a situation where I felt that a nurse was unsafe or the students were unsafe while I was on the unit. Um, there's been times where they have to give patients ETOs, which are emergency treatment orders. But um, in general, it's, it's safer than, for example, the flu. So I worked in a bit, little bit of a higher acuity. Um, but thankfully, if you follow, there's there's precautions and things that you can do. They do CPI training and they teach you like always stand at an arm's length away from a patient, use an L stance, stand with your back against a wall so that, you know, stand closest to the door if you need to leave. So there's things that you can put in place to protect yourself. Um, you know, actually the nurse Scott ED, when you get psych patients that the ED can be equally as dangerous, if not more dangerous because they are not on medications. So, um, our, our psych facility did have, uh, it was a reception center. It was kind of like the ED for just psych and 
unfortunately, the incidences, the incidences that did occur usually happen there because they're coming in, usually dropped off by law enforcement. They're not on medications. And uh, that's where you want to be the most careful. But ED can be just as dangerous, if not more dangerous than, than psych. It's an uncontrolled and environment. Once you know what their diagnosis is, if they need seclusion, then it's a controlled environment. If they don't, then you're good. But when they're first coming in, you don't, you don't know what you're dealing with yet. And I worked in jails and prisons for a few years, and that's the exact same way. They're coming straight off the street. Many of the people in jail are psych patients, unmedicated. Uh, by the time they get to prison, they've been in the system for a year, so it's a lot safer there. But um, just like Bridget was saying, so if you're back to the wall, stand closest to the exit, don't get in front of them or between them, arms length away, yada, yada, yada. And if, you're, if and your facility doesn't confused, that court, go ahead. Just because they're confused, combative, or agitated doesn't always mean they're psych. Oftentimes, more than not, and just because you're med surge, don't think that you're not going to see it. Exactly. We always joke that med surge is jury psych because you're going to get your um, geriatrics who have UTIs, your um, people with liver conditions with hepatic encephalopathy mm -hmm. all the time. In nursing school, you hear altered mental status think completely bsc and that is what they really mean they did not prepare you for when you get on the floor and your person with hepatic encephalopathy is in a posy bed taking his brief diaper off chewing it up and eating the coffin inside yeah, I got more physical harm on a med surge on a med telly floor than on a psych floor. I got scratched more, punched more, spit at. Yeah. Oh yeah. And if your if your facility doesn't include that training for you, um, ask for it. It's ours was called. I've seen CPI. I don't know what it stands for, but we had MAB, which was Management of Assaultive Behavior. Or look it up online and, and educate yourself a little bit about some of these techniques. But that's a I think a, something the department should probably any department. Mm -hmm. And, and another one that's really good is, um, and this is for everybody, if you go on the CMS website, um, they'd have this training uh, for nursing homes on dementia care. Hmm. If you are in hospitals, do dementia care training. It is so important because it is something that a lot don't deal with and aren't familiar with how to redirect. Dementia care is often similar to dealing with a toddler. Mm -hmm. Redirect them. You know, oh, you keep wanting to get out of bed. Hey, you want some more of that chocolate pudding? Let me go get that. That will change their attitude. you get a good two more hours out of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If uh, therapeutic communication and, and those kinds of techniques, if that's communication 101, dementia care is 201. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And like this says, avoid power struggles and ultimatums in Definitely. all situations. Definitely. In all situations. This can apply to things we wish we would have known. That clear if boundaries. Yes. And if so, someone and when, is when complimenting you, like you, you a lot. Do, yes. When you if you're feel like you have to do an ultimatum, do what you do with your children. Make them think it's their idea. <laughs> is that what we're supposed to be doing? Give them a choice. Hey, <laughs> so do you want the red one or the purple one? Well, well, I the, the purple one. The fifteen over there, we're doing red and purple. Yeah, I remember in nursing school they taught us to give patients enough control control over the things they do have control. So, like I tell the psych patients, look, you can't keep me. Yes, you're on a psych hold. We can keep you legally, so you can't leave the room. But you you can decide whether or not you want to get into a gown or not, or you can put TV on or not, yeah. or you know. But you know, you have you can make those kind of choices. The choice to leave or not, I, let's not discuss it. It's not an ultimatum exactly. It's just saying, look, this is a hard line. Now, if you want something to eat, I can order you something to eat. If you don't want to eat, you'd rather sleep right now. I can do that. You know, it's a, yeah. I, I hope we didn't take over the answer to your question, Rajit, about psych nursing, but uh, it bleeds over into all our other areas. Well, piggybacking on what Nurse Liz was saying, um, I believe it was the Stanford prison experiment where mm -hmm. it was just a psychological experiment that they made two ra random groups, uh, the guards and the other groups, the actual uh, prisoners. So I have seen in psych that either techs or nurses, it's, it's like they go crazy with power. And usually, you know, of course, good nurses can get hurt, but usually those are the ones that end up in, in with tremendous amount of ETOs or getting hit because they're using that power and they're holding that power over patients. 
Yeah, Google that. Google the Stanford Prison mm -hmm. Experiment. Yeah, that's that's why. Yeah, that, and just avoid that was one of those experiments. Like it was it was actually terminated early because yeah. things were getting out of control. Yeah. yeah. They, yeah. they cut it short. And and Dr. Phil Zimbardo has made an entire career talking about it. Since <laughs> yeah. that's my own little editorial. I have a degree in psych too, by the way. So. And um, on the advice side, if your patient or anyone is complimenting you a lot, they're not really, that's a, that's a trap. They're if they meet grooming. you immediately complimenting you, they're trying to manipulate you. So It's yep. grooming. Just, yeah, just <laughs> take three steps back and be like, I'm just going to pretend you didn't say that. You're my favorite nurse. Exactly. You're so much better than that other person. Ugh, blah, 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 blah. It's and it's called oh, splitting. It's called you. splitting in mental health. Yeah. Thank you and so much. It you have borderline personality. You didn't mention that when you came in. Thanks. <laughs> 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 so that's a fun fact about you. Yeah, fun um, fact about you. <laughs> uh, Aaron said, can a new grad nurse work in? So we're just kind of doing Q&A here for like 15-ish minutes. And like I said, if you guys want to stick around and help group think, perfect. Um, but you're also, you're free to leave now. You know, thank you. <laughs> just kidding. They were free to leave always. I promise. I'm punching I out. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. um, but do go before we switch topics into like Q&A type stuff. Do go follow them. I think Rachel put their descriptions all down below. They all have excellent insight in their own ways, and they have their own platforms where they share it, which is excellent. Um, so yes, go follow them there. If you do like this discussion, like the but hit click the likey button. It tells the YouTubes you like it. Um, and if you want to have more random offline conversations, if you join the channel, which I think is two dollars, you get to join our Discord server, where we share a lot of pictures of our pets and rant. It's a good time. Um, Aaron said, can you grad work in outpatient or in peds? Um, yes. The challenge is just those jobs are typically more difficult to get because more people want them. And a lot of places are seniority based, but yes. So it's not a limitation of your ability to get them, but are there jobs and are other people fighting over them? Yeah. Always, right, like, I have a student with us right now who graduates in a couple of weeks who already lined up a new grad position at the local um, women's and uh, baby hospital. So, yeah, and like, she is like over the moon with it. So never take no for an answer. The worst thing you could do is apply and be told no. The old question was, can a new grad work in the ER? They really wanted you to have at least a year in the ICU or at least med surge. I was a new grad right into the ER. It depends on the hospital. Some even have new grad programs, which are like six month programs to bring you into like critical care areas. Um, but even if not, you're right. You know, ask maybe somebody on the staff wants to take you on. Maybe if you seem especially bright and interested, they'll take you on. Yeah, for sure. Any, not, a year I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Any advice for having a parent, a mom in this instant in assisted living um, from the nurses? I don't work in assisted living. God, don't do it. What's the, is it like, I, I don't understand the question. Is it advice? Like, probably like general advice. Is there anything you wish you would have known if you had a parent going into like assisted living? Like So for assisted living, it's a little different than a SNP. Um, there, it's more where facility. they just provide medication. Family visitation is one of the biggest things in both the SNP and the um, assisted living um, arenas. Also, if you have any concerns, um, both are supposed to have a residence council um, and a social work liaison. Talk to them, bring up issues, um, try to work it out at that lower level. And if you're not getting answers, file a grievance. Every state has an ombudsman for skilled nursing and um, assisted living care. And if you're not getting a reaction through the director of nursing or the facility administrator, then go to your local ombudsman. Excellent advice. I'm glad someone knew because I was like, I, mm, I've never done skilled nursing. I, I did my whole two months stint as a DON, never again. <laughs> That's that takes a special, a special, special human, and I'm glad they exist. Uh, that is what, if you're around the channel a lot, um, that is what Cal does, and I don't know how he does it. He does great things, but he's working 90 hours this week, so we let him, <laughs> yeah. we let him have the week off. Only 90? Wow, Only he's 90. Back. He's, he is. 
you know. He's and, and, and there are good facilities. So I never did sniff, but I did work at an ALF and it was so I was it was so nice working at a place where I knew the residents were ta well taken care of. Oh, yeah. If you can, if if the family can show up at any time and there you you see that no one is hustling, like oh my gosh, the the parents are here, we gotta or because it was for adults with developmental disabilities, so their parents would come visit them. Um, but the residents were very well taken care of. Um, the, they have a medic like a medication assistance that help them with their meds and their activities of daily living. So there are just do your research and make sure you look into uh, the facility and and other facilities in the area to see which one you like better. Just shop around like with everything else. Mm -hmm. Jasmine um, said, ask questions, stay on top of med changes, open communication. Ad Kemp said, be present, visit mom in her new place, get to know the facility and staff. So it sounds like communication and familiarizing yourself with normal, I would say is good so that you can see abnormal right? When things start to feel funky, but you have to know what feels normal before you can figure out what feels funky, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, a, Amanda Holly said, uh, why can't nurse practitioners prescribe controlled substances? Mine is in Texas and I live in Arkansas, but my NP um, knows about medications and I don't get it. Uh, they can. So in order to prescribe a controlled substance, you just have to have a DEA number. They cost $800 a year mm -hmm. usually. Um, per state, there's not state. like a national yep. one. Nope. Um, you can try to get your employer to pay for it. Some people choose not to. Um, um, one thing and, for MPs to know, if you work for a nonprofit, you can file for, you just need a letter from your uh, employer stage. It's a nonprofit and the DEA waives the fee for nonprofit employers. Oh, nice. And a lot of employers will pay you back for it. Um, but your nurse practitioner can if they have their DEA, but they may not want to. Um, I did not always hold a DEA license. I eventually did. I did not always because I, the provider that I worked with, we agreed that we, there was a huge issue with people coming to new people in my area wanting controlled substances. And a way that we got out of that was I literally could not write them. So we weren't going to me as a new provider initially, if I couldn't write them, then that was not a problem. And then it turned into like, I couldn't really, I needed to be able to write it because a lot of my patients that I had seen for a long time needed controlled substances. Once I had kind of gotten like out of the the newness, but people would literally just shop around for like new well, people. And they might and literally just not. How much it, with this question, it could be that it's a matter of interstate. And that was, yeah, I was going to say it could be a thing. The mm -hmm. nurse practitioner is not licensed also in Arkansas, but I believe both, well, nurse practitioners are the cop at. So you'd have to be licensed in both. They but, might not accept their prescription. And you can't even always. control substance. Yeah. And you can't even, a lot of times across state lines, it gets messed up. So if there's like different state lines, that could be the issue. They might not want they would to. They PMP in both states. They well, exactly. I was going to say that you have to check the PDMP before you yep. prescribe controlled substances <laughs> um, to make sure that they're not doing that, that they're not shopping around for controlled substances. Personally, I, I haven't had a job where they require it. And because of just the liability I've been holding off, I just mm -hmm. don't want that liability. I feel oh, like yeah. situations where you need controlled substances is like for few and far between for a very short amount of time. And it depends on your patient population, mm -hmm. mine um, and what state you live in. So in some states now, gabapentin is considered oh, a control true. substance. Yeah. So you would have to get it there. Mine, I did, um, oh, we had no psych providers and I had a lot of people who had meds for ADHD that they had been on for years and they had no way to get it. So that's actually what ended up, I ended up doing was switching over so that I could just continue people on meds that they had been on for 10 years because no one would write it for that. Like mm -hmm. their person, their psychiatrist, all that. So like, that's why I ended up switching over because they came to their primary care provider who was me and they were like, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And so. I, I paid the $888 to get my DEA number just because it was shorter than my NPI number. And I got tired of writing my NPI number 14 freaking digits <laughs> long. <laughs> that is a flex. <laughs> it worked for me. <laughs> that's a flex. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just no, but I, I also have to, pres fine. I have to prescribe narcotics and, and allow for narcotics mm -hmm. and labor delivery. So, yeah, yeah, and a lot of yeah, and that was the other thing it came down to was yeah, 
how are you? What if, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of things that were controlled that were like, really? Mm -hmm. This and is somebody in the chat's name nurse and they have a question for me. They don't know it, but that's a question for me. <laughs> Go for it, Scott. 38 year old male getting my ADN in May with a BA in psych and planning on going to Ohio University for his BSN. Is there a better route to getting an MSN? I was a told I was told by Ohio to get my BSN first. It'll take two years. Well, I was a bit just slightly younger than that when I got my BA in psychology. I was already a nurse with an ADN and um, I've never been to Ohio, but you can, yeah, go back and get your BSN and then apply and get your master's degree. I think there are some programs though that are RN to MSN degree uh, programs where you will kind of complete your BSN in the, in the process of getting your, your master's degree. I did my bachelor's completion through Western Governors University where you do it on your own schedule. Mm. So, I've heard good things about that. Did you like that? Actually, I did. And I, I'll tell you what, a lot of people were like, oh, is that like a correspondence school? Well, it is distance learning, but I learned a lot and I've been to a lot of schools, so I can tell you good programs and bad programs. Biochemistry, I learned so much in that class. Others were really simple and I did them in a day, but you, you sign up for six months. You pay your money for your six month term and you get you have to do at least three courses, but you can do as many as you want. I did my entire BSN completion in six months. Wow. It's like some of the classes like care of the elderly and nutrition, I did in a day. I read the stuff and like, all right, let me take the <laughs> done. Community health, I had to go out into the community and actually gather information from the resources in my community. That took like three months, like two months or more. So um, that's an option if you want to work at your own pace. Or RN to MSN is another um, another pathway. So there is another option. There are actually two universities, both public universities, that if you have your ADN and a bachelor's in another field, you can apply to their BSN to MSN program and take three additional courses. You yeah. do not earn a BSN. Oh, and that's the University of Southern Alabama and the University of Alabama at Birmingham. So, and that's the route I'm going to be taking because I have a Bachelor's of Applied Science. It's the same BSN to MSN. You're a conditional admit with three additional classes. That's it. So apparently that question was for both of us. <laughs> There yeah, you go. There are, there are, I forgot about that. There are programs for people with a bachelor's and another degree to finish and get a BSN. And it's, um, it, I don't think it takes two years. I thought it was only a year. I believe, just do your research, because I believe, yeah. for example, here in Central Florida, UCF has a program where if they have a bachelor's in another field, it's only a year to yeah. do. So just do your research and ask, well, like, the one with universities Alabama, in your you area. Your BSN at all? It literally is straight MSN program hmm. because you have to have the ADN. So you take your MSN program with one leadership class. And there's three classes that you have yeah. to take. Research, community health, and but leadership. It's like yeah. Simple. Yeah. Although it's, uh, there must be some, look into it more because you usually have to have an RN license to be in an MSN program if it's a clinical. Right. You, have to, you have to have your ADN with your RN. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's that point. Yeah. And, I, I never got way, a BSN. And by the way, 38 is not all that old <laughs> when you think, you know, I mean, later in your life. It when I started my ADN program was 38. So. Just do it. That's what I said. I Better graduated late at 32. Better late than never. I'm going to be 56 when I graduate with my MSN. You look um, so young, Scott. I would have never known. Uh, nurse, <laughs> I said the University of Southern Alabama and the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Nurse Scott went to Western Governors University. It's a great memory. I'm very impressed. Good job. <laughs> I'm like, dang. Um, let me see. I think. Do, 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 do. Oh, the VA. Does anyone know anything about the VA? Esther yeah. said, does anyone know anything about the VA? Is the, it worth the scholarship? So the VA is really difficult to get into. If you can get into it and use their program, it is one of the most sought after nursing positions you can get. Everywhere I've been, everyone wants to work at the VA. I mean, mm -hmm. and as on the flip side of it, as cited by clinicals at the VA in Biloxi, Mississippi, it was an interesting experience because the patient population 
is so constrained. So you, it's nowhere near as busy as a mainstream hospital would be. And then, so you get to do a little bit more too because you're under federal rules and not state rules. So that's a little interesting and different. And then also I, with the VA as a patient. So it's a very interesting area of nursing. I would say for the VA, you can't get bought. If you're a type of person that gets annoyed by things that don't make sense, don't work for the VA. <laughs> don't work for the VA. the VA. Nothing will make sense. Oh my can. gosh. It just, it doesn't make sense. They make you jump through so many hoops. You get so many perks job wise, but like if you want something that's streamlined and you're like, oh, that's a reasonable way to do it. But even in nursing in general, like it's not streamlined. It could be so much better. And when you give them suggestions, they, they're they like, nope, this is the way we've always done it. But we still also use faxes the, the in healthcare. Fax machines. Or they say, would you like to be on a committee? We can look at that if you want to start a committee. Oh, yeah. Like, uh -huh. uh, governance is a big thing with us. But the flip side to it is, too, they are a single payer health system. So if you're going to do training on something and you want to open up a chest tube just to show it around and stuff, that and everywhere else that they all know that cost too much, they don't care. <laughs> yep. Um, yep. Who said Kate says here in Los Angeles, getting a job at the VA or other county or coveted outstanding benefits. Same where I've always been. Mm -hmm. never left. People that went to the VA never left. I worked at Cedar sinai in LA. It's a good place to work. Very fancy. All right, friends. Well, let's see. It was fancy. Good job. Um, what did we calling? What are we calling ourselves now? The, uh, the, academy. the academy. The academy. Well done, Academy. <laughs> and of online nurses. Maybe Jay Michael better. had called it the Academy of the Internet <laughs> Academy of Nurse Influencers. <laughs> I like that. American Academy of Nurse Influencers. I like it. Perfect. Well, I'm gonna put it on my resume and see if anybody even notices. No, we should all. And I founded it. I'm gonna put founder. <laughs> okay. Good. That will look very fancy. They'll be like, "What is? What is this?" I'll be like, "You haven't heard of it?" And make them feel stupid. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh. Like, what is? What is this? Like, you haven't heard of it. Like, oh, there's an echo. Yeah, there's just an echo. I just muted muted you, Bridget. Uh, yeah. back. Um. Okay. Oh, her daughter worked near Scott. Who said Kate's daughter work at Sierra Sinai and loves it? Um, will I be covering yeah. the next Minnesota strike? I will. Yes. Someone just sent me accidentally dropped some information in my email box. Uh, if you have, it's fallen in there. I know. If you have information to accidentally fall into my email box, this is my email. I'll put it up on screen about the Minnesota strike. Um, people are. Oh, I spelled my name wrong. That's not helpful. <laughs> How do you spell your own name wrong? I, no, I don't want to talk about it. Oh, come on, um, <laughs> and I almost just put myself, I almost just blocked myself trying to delete the message. <laughs> You've been off your meds too long. <laughs> it's true. Um, oh, now we're all in trouble. Dad's all off the straw. I know. Minnesota Strike is coming up. I have one coming out tomorrow on the um, Tennessee hospital shooting thing, just kind of running it down, putting it on the internet so people know what it is. And then I have a huge debunking one about that stupid video that went on the internet about died suddenly or something where we basically tear the entire video apart. So that'll be a good time. Hey, question. Does anybody know if that uh, hospital in Atlanta actually closed or not? Did yes, the, the ER did. Story? Oh, yeah. The ER, but the rest uh, of the hospital is open. Atlanta Med Spa or whatever it was. Yeah. I think we're going to have to come up with a different name for our academy because if we decide we're going to be granting people fellowship, uh -huh. the American Academy of Nurse Influencers, this is the initials after their name. <laughs> <laughs> I do not think we have to change it at all. Uh, and I'm also a fellow of the American Academy of Nurse Influencers. Yeah. I am a huge I act fanny. like a fanny sometimes. I'm a fanny. Yeah. yeah. RNMSN <laughs> fanny. Oh my word! That's, a, that's I'm still putting it on my resume. <laughs> uh, I say we keep it. That makes it better. Yes. What, I'm can down. You, can uh, you just, I say we as, keep it. As the founder, Liz, can you officially make us all fellows? Just can you grant us that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Going to virtually knight us. Bow okay. down now. <laughs> like, I have to get my stethoscope. I don't know where it is. We'll wait, do it wait, next time. Our we'll packs, we get our fanny packs. Oh my gosh. <laughs> wait. Where is, um, oh, where's the thing? 
we're waiting with bated oh, no, breath. I thought there's a way to do the, um, where you change your name on here. Never yeah. did I think. Oh, the three dots ever, edit uh, name uh, at the here. bottom. A founder <laughs> or your, yes. He's going to put nurse Scott Fanny. <laughs> Can I just say that when I started right. the, on the internet, never did I think that if I ever made merch, it would say Fanny, but it will. Um, yeah. <laughs> so if you get rid of the quote, our names will show up. There we go. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Perfect. Perfect. Um, <laughs> Fanny certified. <laughs> yeah. yes. I'm going to put that on my CV and see if anybody asks. <laughs> yeah. That's right. kind of like, look at them like they're the dumb one when you, they don't know. They're like, oh, this is <laughs> very prestigious. It are probably won't show. You not, you not, you know. If you don't know, then you don't know. So just don't even worry about it. Okay. If you just don't, if you don't, it's fine. Are you not plugged into the online influencer community? No. no. Yeah. <laughs> you were. Are you not? <laughs> Oh, I'm a fan of Fanny. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, um, I move that our first merch be a Fanny pass. Yes. And, and on it, we'll have stencil. This is my F A N N I pack. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to be a fellow in the academy before you can actually. That's play. right. Law to beat your arts out. Well, only we get to wear it. <laughs> Amazing. Um, oh, Jamie said I'm a Minnesota nurse in a non-union hospital and the three day strike in September was awful. I'm terrified for the 20 days, 20 day strike. It's oh, 20 man. days. I have not even started looking oh, into it crazy. yet. Literally. I just saw an email in my inbox. Oh my gosh. It's only, it's three or four hospitals this time, isn't it? It's like less hospitals. Wow, a long time. Is I don't there anything know. else I we should actually, be covering? Yeah, I was, I was actually, I had, I was going to talk about it, but I haven't done any haven't looked it up enough yet to know more than it's just a lot of nurses on strike. <laughs> yeah. If there's, if there's anything else we should be talking about, let me know. Cause sometimes I live under a rock. If striking um, gets their attention. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. We'll do that. I need to write down the name of this thing. Okay. Well, thanks for being here, friends. I'm glad we established an entire organization that was very productive. Um, <laughs> covered a lot of good advice. <laughs> Scott uh, <laughs> changed his name. <laughs> I know. Wow. Chad's behind. <laughs> so I, I am behind. Oh, yeah, perfect. J. Michael changes. Excellent. Um, perfect. All right. Well, thanks. It was a very productive meeting. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, <laughs> Academy of members and, uh, you know, founder or founding members. You're I'm all wonderful. Um, we will probably convene same time next week. Uh, unsure what the meeting will be about, but. All are welcome. <laughs> Thanks for being here. <laughs> Remember that you, my friends, you are not alone. You are more than enough and you can do all the hard things. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Bye. 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 Oh. Boop. Boop.